For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. Come join us for a new five-week sermon series with Pastor Tim Rowland, Riverbank Reflections, valuable lessons from the rivers in scripture, moving forward when it seems easier to go back, starting Sunday, May 30th. Together, we'll look at the rivers in the Bible and what it takes to advance forward to the promises of God instead of heading back into the wilderness. In-person services at 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. and online broadcast at 9.30 at newhopechurch.net. We're going to get pretty heavy, pretty serious. So uh, because of that, I thought I ought to start off on a light note. All right, so we're going to be looking um, at some of the rivers in the Bible over the next five weeks, and uh, we're going to plunge in pretty deep today. Uh, So I need to do a little setup for the light humor to begin with. Uh, Some of you aren't old enough to remember or know what this term uh, temperance preaching is. All right, Uh, so let me, uh, back in the turn of the century when there was a lot of bootlegging going on, do, do you all know what bootlegging is? Oh, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, I got about a 16-year-old saying, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, that's it's when you make it an underground, all right? So, well, anyway, during the bootlegging days, lots of churches were preaching on the subject of temperance, all right? In other words, stay away from that filthy liquor, all right? So, that's the setting for the story. Otherwise, it won't be funny at all, all right? So, there was a preacher winding, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into old preacher mode for just a moment as I tell this story, Okay? So there was a preacher winding up his temperance sermon with great fervor and gusto, and it went like this. If I had all the beer in the world, I'd take it down and throw it in the river. And the congregation all said, amen, brother. All right, you guys with me? You figure out how this is working now? All right. So he went on and said, if I had all the wine in the world, I'd take it down and throw it in the river. And the congregation said, yeah, you're getting into this. And if I had all the whiskey and rum in the world, I'd take it all down and throw it in the river. And they said, yeah, all right. After the sermon, the preacher sat down and the deacon stood up who led the music and said, for our closing hymn, turn to page 126 and let's sing, shall we gather at the river? (laughs) I love it. I love it. Anyway, just over a month ago, we wrapped up a year-long series called Mountain Moments for Rugged Valley Walks. And what we were attempting to do was discover the truths that we find in the Bible from mountaintop moments from the Old Testament to the New Testament that might make a difference in the way in which we live our everyday lives in the valley. And what we're going to be doing over the next five weeks is we're going to spend some time on the riverbanks that we find in Scripture And it's there we're going to reflect on the idea of moving forward instead of going backwards when it would be so much easier to go back than to go forward. If you haven't figured this out already, we're going to be spending a little time on the banks of the Jordan River. And we're going to look at the stories there of Moses leading Israel to the banks of the Jordan River with a promised land just on the other side. And look at the decision they made then and the consequences of that poor decision And then we will come back to the banks of the Jordan River 40 years later with Joshua as their leader. And they have the same opportunity they had 40 years before. You see, God is a God of second chances. And he gave them another opportunity to get it right. And so there are valuable lessons for us to learn from the banks of the rivers in the Bible. Mountaintop vistas that we looked at over the past year those kind of things, climbing to the top of a mountain and looking at the scenery out there, those wow me about a God who spoke all of that beauty into existence. You see, when I get there, God's creation yells at me about how grand and glorious and wonderful God is. He is incredibly powerful, and I learned that from the mountaintops. But riverbanks, riverbanks for me are where God humbles me by his willingness to whisper to my heart about me. It's at the riverbank that he is intimately personal with my life. 
this God who is so powerful that he speaks creation to existence is also so personal. He whispers into my ear about his plans and his promises and his provisions for my life. Mountaintops are where I get excited and enthused and I yell at God about how awesome he is. But riverbanks are where I go quiet. I relax. I listen to God about what he wants me to learn from my past and how I could use it in my future. Max Licato tells a story in one of the first books that he wrote called Six Hours, One Friday. And he tells the story of a missionary in Brazil who discovered a tribe of Indians in a very remote part of the jungle. They lived very primitively and they lived very close to an extremely large river. This tribe was in need of some immediate medical attention. There was a very contagious disease that was spreading throughout their village and people were dying daily. A hospital was not very far away from this village, but it was across the river. The Indians would not cross it because they believed the river was inhabited by evil spirits. Though they believed there was help on the other side, they were terrified of the river itself. To enter its water would mean certain death. The missionary explained how he had crossed the river many times and was unharmed, but they were not impressed. He then walked them down to the banks of the river and he placed his water, his hands in the water all the way up to his elbows and brought them out and showed nothing happened, but it didn't matter. They were still afraid to enter the river. Finally, the missionary dove into the water and he swam beneath the surface of the water until he emerged on the other side and came up on the bank on the other side and he raised his fists in triumphant victory. And they all yelled and cheered from across the way. And then they dove into the river and followed him over. You see, folks, spiritual health is found in a life of faith that moves us out of the familiarity of our comfort zone and ushers us into God's promised land. It sounds so easy, but it's not. You see, faith in God and the promises of God have a very persistent enemy. And the enemy is fear and problems. You and I on the banks of a river have to make some important decisions. Will faith and promise be the driving force of our life? Or will fear and problems hold us Way back here. Will it keep us in our past? We've grown comfortable, even if it's in the wilderness. We've grown comfortable in the wilderness. Jeremiah has something to say about that. The book of Jeremiah, hopefully you found it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets out of the Old Testament. Major not because he's more important than the minor prophets. Simply major because it's a big book. Jeremiah wrote a lot. Jeremiah didn't only write a lot, but he did something else a lot, and as a result, has a nickname. Thomas, one of the disciples of Jesus, had a nickname. He's known today as Doubting Thomas, all right? Jeremiah has a nickname. What's his? The Weeping Prophet. Jeremiah cried all the time. His tears flowed quickly. Of course, he had a lot to cry about. You'll find out about that as we begin to read here. So follow along with me, beginning in Jeremiah 17, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. This is not Jeremiah. This is God himself talking to Jeremiah. Here's what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws their strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Every time I read heart, I want you to think of that because that's a thrust of what we're talking about today, our hearts. That person... What person? The one who is cursed. Why is he cursed? Because he puts more confidence in man than he does in God. That person will be like a bush in a wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one, no one lives. But blessed, I don't know about you, but I like to find out what's next. Cursings I don't much care about. Blessings I love to hear about. But blessed is the one 
whose trust is in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots out by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. And may I suggest to you in this month of May of 2021, we can also say it has no worries in a year of a pandemic, something we haven't experienced and over 112 years, and this person never fails to bear fruit. The, what's the next word? The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand that? I, the Lord, search what? I search the heart and his law. It's precepts, it's instructions, it's teachings, it's principles. This person habitually meditates, ponders, studies by day and by night, and as a result, they are blessed. And this person shall be like a tree. Here's where the similarities comes in. Firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth fruit in its season. Its leaf also will not fade or wither, and everything this person does shall prosper and will come to maturity. Not so with the wicked, those disobedient and living without God. Not true of them, but they are like the chaff. They're worthless and they're dead, and they're without substance, and the wind drives them away. Therefore, the wicked... Those that are disobedient and living without God, they shall not stand in the judgment day, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God. For the Lord knows, and he's fully acquainted with the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly, those living outside of God's will shall perish, and their life will end in ruin and come to naught. You see, the person who trusts in humanity will end up like a shriveled bush, while the person who puts their trust in God will be like a tree with its roots sunk deep down into the stream of living water. So how do we fix this cheating heart of mine? How do we heal the sin-sick soul? How do we fix this problem heart? Jeremiah says in chapter 8, verse 22, he asks a question, actually. Jeremiah, after he's wept over the people and he's talked to them about what they're facing, he then cries out with a question, is there no balm in Gilead? What's a balm? That's B-A-L-M, not B-O-M-B. Okay? What's a balm? It's an ointment. Okay? It's, it's something that has... Um, healing properties to it that you would put on an infection or a sore or an open wound. And Jeremiah is saying, is there not something we can put on this cheating heart that can keep it from cheating? Is there not something that we can put on this wicked heart that can make it righteous? Is there not something we can put on this sick soul of ours and cure it? Is there not a physician around? What's one of the descriptions of Jesus in the New Testament? He is the great physician. When Jeremiah asks, is there no bomb in Gilead? What he was really saying is, doesn't somebody have some Vicks vapor rub? Come quickly. (laughs) Jeremiah simply asking, is there anything that God can do for wayward, ailing, unhealthy people? And there is, in fact, a cure. There is a balm. We know it according to the song we heard sung today. It's found in the principles of amazing grace in the person of Jesus Christ. For he is the one who extended the balm of Gilead to all of us. When in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he extended this invitation. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary who are burdened down, all of you who are wounded and hurt, all of you who are sick, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, take my ointment if you want to, and learn from me for I am gentle and I am humble where? I am humble in heart. 
And if we'll let the humility of Christ rule and reign in our heart, we will then experience the promise. We will find rest for our souls. We often don't like to talk about the painful part of the history of America, the history of slavery in this country. And yet I find, I find inspiration from those men and women who were brought here and who lived here as slaves. Because they may have been, they may have been in physical slavery, but many of them had far greater liberty than the masters who owned them and abused them. They had a freedom of spirit and soul that those human masters never possessed. And how do we know this? We know this if we take the time to study our history. And we will discover that many of those who found themselves physically bound as indentured servants and slaves to other humans had found freedom in Jesus Christ. Some of the most well-known songs that have been sung in churches in the first 50 years of the 19th century and the 20th century were written by slaves. There is one that particularly addresses this passage in Jeremiah 8.22 where Jeremiah asks a question, is there a bomb in Gilead? And those incredibly freed slaves gave an answer to Jeremiah's question. They would sing in the fields as they worked, yes, there is a bomb of Gilead. And that song goes like this. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and deep I feel the pain. In prayers, the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Can you hear these men and women laboring in a field under human slavery singing about this freedom? There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal this sin sick soul. If you can't pray like Peter, if you can't be like Paul, go home and tell your neighbor, he died to save us all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the wounded soul. Jeremiah says, excuse me, Isaiah says in chapter 26, verse 3, God will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. How's your heart? How's your heart doing today? Has it been cheating? Please understand something. It is not sin to use human means to solve our problems. It is not sin to take or not take a vaccination. It's not sin to go to a doctor and get their advice and their direction. That is not sin. But I tell you what is sin, folks. It's when we put more trust in them than we do in God. That's when it becomes sin. To think they are better than God's ways or to leave God completely out of the process that our life is going through, that is a cheating heart. So who do we turn to for help? The Bible leaves little doubt on that. And again, Jeremiah would have known this. In Psalm 121, it's called a song of ascents. The psalmist wrote these words, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which, what? Comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the one who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He will keep. He will keep you, for he does not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. The sun will not burn you, for you're in my right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, now and forevermore. 
Can you say, my help, my strength comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth? In fact, let me see if I can imprint that into your thought process. Why don't you quote that with me out loud? All right, let me say it one more time, and then we'll say it together. My help and strength comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My help and strength comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. One more time. My help and strength comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Let me wrap this up. There's a story told about a man who lost his wife. She died, leaving him to be both mother and father to their six-year-old son. After the memorial service was over and the father and son went home, both of them were feeling very alone and grieved by their loss. That night, as they prepared to go to bed, the boy asked his father, Daddy, may, may I sleep in your room tonight? The father, of course, said yes. But neither one of them could seem to go to sleep. They tossed and they turned in bed for a long part of the night. Finally, the little boy rolled over and tapped his dad on the shoulder and said, Daddy, would you watch me while I go to sleep? I said, of course I will. He said, I think if you watch me, I think I could go to sleep. And the father said, of course. The little boy at last started to relax, and in a matter of minutes, he fell asleep. After the son was asleep, the father got out of bed, and he walked over to the window, and he pulled back the curtains. And he looked up into the star-filled sky, and he said, Father, are you looking at me? Because if you are, I think I can rest and find peace. The Scripture says that God is looking, looking, looking for any man or woman, boy or girl, whose heart is turned towards Him. Father's looking at you, and He knows if your heart is true, or He knows if your heart has been cheating. And here's the good news. Andrew preached it to us last week. If our heart has been cheating, the Father is looking, looking, looking for you to turn your heart towards home. And He'll restore you. All right, well, good morning. Last Sunday, we began a new five-week series called uh, Riverbank Reflections. Uh, at the Riverbank, it's a moment for us to uh, make some important decisions as we reflect back about the past and we anticipate what's on the other side. Riverbank Reflections, when it's easier to go back than it is to cross over. And I thought it was important for us to do this at this particular point in the history of our own lives, for we live in a very unique time. We are living at the conclusion of a pandemic. It's been since 1912 the world has gone through that. So you and I as a generation have an opportunity to look back, to reflect, and to make some decisions at this moment in time in our personal lives and in our collective lives together as part of the kingdom church of God in this world. What is the church going to represent about God as we step into the future? And so last week, I shared uh, seven questions with you for us to contemplate over these next few weeks as we look at the biblical story of the children of Israel crossing the Jordan River. And as you know, they didn't get it right the first time, so they had a second opportunity. And so you and I have the privilege of looking back at that story, failure and faith that brought success, and look at our own situation and see what choice will we make at the banks of the river of 2021. So let me just review these seven questions. Uh, I knew that I gave them out too fast last week for you to write them all down. And uh, I sent them out in an email. Maybe some of you read the email, and I decided we'd print it here today. And uh, you can take a few notes on this piece of paper, or you can throw it in the garbage can on your way out, all right? But at least you'll have the questions if you would like. So let me just review those very quickly. And before I review the questions, just a couple of reminders. Number one. You are not to answer these questions about somebody else. These are not questions for you to answer about your spouse, about your kids, about your coworker, and certainly not about your pastors. Okay? These are questions you answer about yourself. And the second uh, observation before you answer these questions is be very much aware 
be very sensitive to self-justification. Well, I would have done better here, but, okay? No, this is between you and the Holy Spirit that as you look at the past, you really learn. This is a chance for a step of growth in all of our personal lives, but only as we make this personal and as we make it honest, all right? So here's the seven questions. Did the culture of the past year shape my faith or did my faith shape my response to the culture? And that's true in a pandemic culture or any other kind of culture that we're living in, all right? Um, even in a culture called cancel culture, <laughs> okay? What's going to shape your faith? Or is your faith going to be shaped by the culture. Number two, did my faith in and dependence on Jesus grow during this past year? Is it stronger now than before March of 2020, or have I become more independent from Jesus, and as a result, my faith in Him has been weakened during this time? Number three, did I enjoy and experience greater faith through last year, or was I frustrated and manipulated more by fear? Number four, did I find myself frustrated by trying to fit my faith into the circumstances, or did I simply rest in my faith through the circumstances? Number five, did I investigate the Scriptures more or less than news networks, Facebook? What or who impacted your life more during the past 15 months? Now, as I read this little list that I put there, some of it's tongue-in-cheek humor, but understand, nothing on this list is wrong. Not one thing on this list, the either or the or, neither one of them are wrong. Just one is more right than the other. All right? Science or scripture? Politicians or pastors? Family or Fauci? <laughs> Who? All right? And that's, that's not a musical group or an owl, okay? All right? Or the Holy Spirit, CDC press releases or Old Testament, New Testament scriptures and messages. Number six, has corporate worship, what we're doing right now, here to our live stream family at home, to our uh, other folks who are over in the barn right now sharing with us, has corporate worship, the gathering. Remember, the word church is a New Testament word. And the literal Greek translation of the Greek word ecclesia, literally translated is the gathering. So has corporate worship, the gathering of the faith family, become more a matter of convenience than conscience, comfort than commitment, self-centeredness rather than Christ-focused? Do I prefer worship without sacrifice, church without fellowship, Christianity without commitment? Question seven, am I better prepared for the what-ifs that will come in the future than I have been in the past? Remember, it is not sin to use human means to help solve our problems. Hear that well. It is not sin to use human means to help solve our problems. If you're sick, go to the doctor. Okay? If, uh, if you have financial trouble, get on a budget. Okay? There are lots of practical things from human means that can be instrumental in solving our problems. But it is sin to trust those things more than it is to trust God. To think that human ways are better than God's ways or to leave God completely out of a specific or all-inclusive problem-solving process, that is a serious mistake. And it's you and I choosing to be independent from God in that area. And folks, that's what sin is, is independence from God. You've heard me preach from this pulpit before. I can be preaching to you and sinning while I'm preaching. Okay? Because Danny Boitano did something this last week that made me really angry, and I decided, you know what? He's too big for me to take on face-to-face, -face, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smack him upside the head in a sermon. And I work out a whole sermon that just deals with what he made me mad over. Now, let me clarify. Danny has not made me mad, okay? But if I do that in a sermon, even though I'm quoting Scripture using great illustration, I have been sinning because that sermon prep had nothing to do with dependence upon God. It had everything to do with my will and my will alone. And so sin is not really the horrible, ugly acts that we always use to describe it. It is that, it is that willful independence that I'm going to do what I want when I want to do it, and I'm going to do it in my own way and in my own strength. 
And so last week, we spent most of our time looking at Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10, as we looked at our heart. And the question we really asked last week was, how's your heart? Is it faithful or trusting, or is it cheating and self-reliant? We reminded you of an old Hank Williams song, Your Cheating Heart. And we ask you to compare, what kind of heart do you have? For 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And so what kind of heart has we, have we had this past year? As we stand at the banks of the river of Jordan at this moment in our life, has our heart been reliant upon Christ or have we been cheating and dabbling with things of independence? And so last week I gave, um, I gave you a homework assignment, as I recall. And uh, I ask you to read uh, Numbers, four chapters in the book of Numbers. Th oh, excuse me, two chapters, 13 and 14. And then Joshua chapter 1 through 4. I had a gentleman in the last service tell me, he said, Tim, I, was, I only got two hours of sleep last night. He said, I was up all night. I was reading the scriptures and I was putting your outline and I was putting my outline of what I learned from you last week, what we might be studying this week. And I said, well, that's good because you had a really nice nap during service today. So... <laughs> He actually didn't sleep through service. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so j j I, I know I shouldn't do this, but how many of you did your homework? Ra raise your hand. Yeah. You are much better than the 8 o'clock service. Much larger percentage. All right, thank you all. And the reason I had you do it is it saves time for us today. And so we'll still try to hit some highlights out of those chapters. Uh, but what we're going to really be talking about today is this, this looking at what governs our heart when we're at the riverbank of reflection as we're thinking about advancing forward or is it easier just to go back where we came from, this whole idea of faith and fear. Someone uh, once wrote a story about a woman who for many years couldn't sleep at night because she was always fearful that her home was going to be burglarized. One night after her and her husband had been married 10, 12 years, her husband heard a noise downstairs in the house. So we went down to investigate. When he got down there, he caught the burglar red-handed. And the husband said to the burglar, hey, would you come upstairs and meet my wife? She's been waiting for you for 10 years. <laughs> you see, a real burglar can steal our joy and our faith maybe once. But fear and worry can steal our joy and our faith night after night after night. Fear not only steals our sleep, but it steals our health and our ability to live with life productively. What I'd like to do is not read all of the six chapters that I gave to you, but I do want to read a couple of verses from each section. So in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. Numbers, chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. Now, the setting of the story... And we're going to go back and review more of the story in just a few moments. But where this is exactly in Numbers 14, the children of Israel have left Egypt where they were slaves. They have walked a short journey through the wilderness. A lot of people have different ideas how long this took. Some say it could have been as short as 11 days. Most think it was probably closer to somewhere around 40 plus days. And that brings them now to the River Jordan. A chance to decide to go on in to the land that is their home, the land God promised to them, a land that flowed with milk and honey. And Moses sent out 12 spies, and 12 spies went into the land. Do you know how long they stayed in the land? Forty days, all right? So all the nation of Israel sat on the banks of the river contemplating, thinking about the report they would receive, thinking about the directions that God had already given them up to this point to go and possess the land that God had given to them. After 40 days, the 12 spies come back. And as you know from reading this, there are two reports. There is not unity or agreement out of the 12 men. Ten give a report. All of them agree that the land is wonderful and incredible and it's productive and there would be lots of opportunity and many blessings there. All 12 agreed on that. But 10 of them said, there are fence cities, there are large armies, and there are gigantic people. We cannot do this. We should go the other way. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back with the same report of how great the land was, and then they said, and that's where we are in chapter 14, all right, 
verses, uh, verses 6 through 9. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. One side note, just out of the reading of that passage, notice if we allow fear to influence our decision, what does God call it? Rebellion. Okay, that, that's his word in this passage, not mine. Do not rebel against the Lord. That's what he calls it. Now, flip over, a, flip over a, to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. This is 40 years later. They didn't make the right decision the first time. They get a second chance. So now Joshua, he's learned from Moses, don't send 12 spies. <laughs> send two. <laughs> send two, all right, because 10 might make the heart of the people melt, all right? Let's just send two. And so Joshua chapter 2, verse 24, and they, referring to the two spies, said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given, what's that next word? The whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Forty years before, the Israelites' heart heart melted in fear because of those who lived in the land. This time around, the people in the land, I, I suspect the hearts of the people 40 years before were melting in fear too, but they weren't willing to make the right decision. So, so here's what we're going to do for the next several minutes this morning. We're going to relive the story because I, I, I don't know how many of you know the story anymore, all right? A lot of folks never have been taught the story of the deliverance of the nation of Israel out of Egypt and their journey to the promised land. And, and, and a lot of folks, even though they may know the story, have never followed Paul's direction in the New Testament about how to look back at the Old Testament. And in Galatians chapter 4, verses 24, Paul says this about the historical evidence of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. He said these things, and specifically, if you want to go check it out, he's talking about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and the descendants of Abraham and Sarah as children of faith and the descendants of Hagar, children of rejection and rebellion. All right? And he goes on to say these things, in other words, these historical events that we have recorded in our Old Testament Bible, and that's the only Bible that Paul had. He didn't have the New Testament. He was still writing most of it, all right? But what he did have was the Old Testament. And so he says these things that have been recorded for us are not only a historical record of what happened to our people, but these things are written as an allegory. These things are written figuratively. In other words, it's true, but there is more to it than just the history. The word allegory literally means the picture of one thing in the image of another. So how do we look at historical events from the Bible and what lessons can be learned that may make a difference in our spiritual development? And so what we're going to look at today is what does Egypt mean allegorically? What does the Red Sea mean allegorically? What does the wilderness mean allegorically, spiritually? What does the River Jordan mean two different times allegorically? And what is Canaan land? And so that's what we're going to attempt to cover today. All right? So let's jump in. Egypt. Uh, again, Old Testament history is... Uh, there wasn't a nation called the children of Israel yet. There were descendants from Abraham. All right? Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They finally made it to the promised land. And uh, there, were, there, were, there were sons that were born there, and one of them's name was Joseph. Call that? And uh, his older brothers were very jealous of him. 
And so they decided to kill him, and then they decided, oh, that wouldn't be a good thing. I'm glad reason came into this thing. And so they sold him, but told their father he had been killed. And Joseph had a roller coaster ride, and he ended up, after some ups and downs, he ended up being the second most powerful man in the country of Egypt. He was the next most powerful guy right under Pharaoh. And the reason he was is because he was an interpreter of dreams, a gift that God had given him. And he told the, the Pharaoh that a famine is coming and he needed to prepare during seven years of plenty, during seven years of big harvests and lots of water, we need to prepare for seven years when things are going to be barren. In other words, plan ahead. And Egypt did. And during the famine then, Joseph's father and brothers in the promised land, they were starving. And the brothers said, hey, let's go over to Egypt and see if we can get some food. Those brothers were in for the shock of their life. When they got there, the person they had to ask for food from turned out to be their baby brother. And they were terrified because they thought, he'll just wipe us out like we tried to do him. But Joseph had the heart of God. And Joseph said to his brothers, what you intended for evil in my life, God has used it for good. And so the brothers and his dad, they moved to Egypt, and they stayed there. And they should have left after the famine was over. They should have gone back home. But guess what? Life was good. Their families multiplied and grew. Their, their businesses grew. They, they, they had prosperity in the land of another nation, not the land of milk and honey that God promised as their home. But they, through apathy, were content to stay in Egypt. And after about 200 years, a new Pharaoh was in charge. And he looked around and said, this is, a literal trans this is a literal translation of a verse in the Old Testament. These Israelites, they multiply like rabbits. Their nation was growing and growing and growing. They were growing faster than the Egyptian families were. And the Pharaoh looked around and said, oh my goodness, if we don't do something, they will not be loyal citizens. And so Egypt made them slaves. And the Israelites lived for 200 plus years in slavery in Egypt until God raised a leader by the name of Moses. And that had its ups and downs too. Aren't you and I glad God is so patient? <laughs> God spent 40 years training Moses for leadership, and in one bad decision of independence, Moses squandered that opportunity. And guess what Moses had to do for 40 years? Wander around in a wilderness, <laughs> all right? Subservient to his father-in-law until God prepared him again for leadership. And then Moses led the children, children of Israel out of Egypt. Egypt is a picture of slavery because of apathy and rebellion. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul writes Romans 3.23. That's Egypt. That's where all of us were born into. We were born into Egypt, into a place of sinful slavery, controlled by our own appetites, and God wants to deliver us. Well, how does he do that? He takes us to the Red Sea. The Red Sea is, is a place that we must cross in order to escape sin's penalty. And we cross this Red Sea by faith. We must pass through. Hebrews 11.29 talks about this. Hebrews 11.29 says, this is a picture of redemption. You had to pass through the Red Sea. There's, there's an old song that we, uh, we used to sing at church. It used to be one of my dad's favorites. He had a cassette tape that he played uh, of this old preacher who would preach a sermon and then sing this song at the end of the sermon. It's called, God Leads His Dear Children Along. And it goes like this. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads His dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Now catch the chorus. Some through the waters, the Red Sea. Some through the flood, Noah and his family. Some through the fire, the Hebrew children. But all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. In the night season and all the day long. 
Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley in the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose us, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. Why? Because God leads his dear children along. Away from the mire, away from the clay, up, away up into glory, eternity's day. Why? God leads his dear children along, some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. That's the Red Sea. We got across it. Then there's the wilderness. The wilderness is the journey of transition, of being delivered from the consequences of sin in Egypt on our way to the blessings of freedom and promise in a relationship with God himself. The wilderness, it's a time of maturing faith, growing faith, strengthening faith. It's the time for us to go from spiritual infancy of new birth to at least that toddler adolescent stage, all right? It, it wasn't intended to be really long, but it is a period of time, and I don't know exactly what it is. The, the children of Israel could have made this journey, according to various historians, anywhere from as rapidly as 11 days to 40-plus days. Some said if they just walked a mile a day, they would have done it in nine months. This wasn't intended to be an extremely long journey, but it was a coming to understand this new life I have in Christ. Stop living like a slave and start living like a person who can really make good choices. And where are you going in this journey? Where am I going? I'm going to Canaan. We call it the promised land. Sometimes hymnology confuses theology. You know, ology is the study of, so our study of hymns and our study of God sometimes don't always match up. We, we take a lot of license in songs because it's poetic, it sounds pretty. And a lot of songs I grew up singing equated crossing the Jordan River and getting to Canaan as dying and going to heaven. That is not the allegory. That is a bad allegory, all right? Allegories have to be consistent in order to be appropriate. And, 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 and this is not consistent. You're saying, Tim, why isn't it consistent? Man, it was a place of peace and blessing. It, well, but it wasn't all the peace. It wasn't all peace. There were enemies in Canaan. Are there going to be any enemies in heaven? No. Is there going to be any sin in heaven? No, there's no more battles to fight. It is victory complete when we arrive on the shores of heaven. Canaan land is land in this world, but an absolute dependence upon God. It is not pie in the sky when I die. It is Christ himself right now in me in the here and now, living his victorious life through me every moment of every day. Indeed, it is only the Lord Jesus himself who is capable of living the abundant Christian life in us. As Romans 5.10 declares, he not only reconciles us to God by his death, but he saves us moment by moment by his life. And that is to say that Christ died not only for what we have done, but he rose again to live in us to take the place of what we are. It is his strength for my weakness. It is his wisdom for my foolishness. It is his drive for my drifting. It is his grace for my greed. It is his love for my lust. It is his peace for my problems. His joy for all of our sorrows is plenty for our poverty. This is what Canaan is. Another old hymn, out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, into thy freedom, gladness, and light, out of my sickness, into your health, out of my want, into your wealth, out of my sin, into yourself, Lord Jesus, I come, I come. It's coming with that complete abandon and the fullness of all that Jesus is to live this life on earth as the Father sent the Son, now the Son, with all that the Son is, to do in me what I can't do. He never said I could. But he always said he would, and it's allowing me to let him do it every moment of every day. This is Canaan land. We were brought out of Egypt in order to be brought into Canaan. We were brought out of sin in order to be brought in to the promise. The purpose of redemption is to bring us out of the control of sin and into the sufficiency of Christ. This was God's purpose for his people then, and this is God's purpose for his redeemed people now. 
But just as we had to get out of Egypt by crossing the Red Sea, we can only enter Canaan by crossing the Jordan River. Don't ask me why. It's in the book. Why? What does the Jordan River represent? This next step of growth. The first step we made was a step to be born again. Step to be forgiven. To give up on ourselves and to be dependent upon God. The next step is how I'm going to live my life. And here's the interesting, fascinating thing. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the Apostle Paul tells us then, just as you received Jesus Christ, just as you crossed the Red Sea, how'd they cross the Red Sea? Moses stepped into it, smacked it with a stick, and the waters parted. Some are saying that the Red Sea really wasn't that deep. Okay? And I'm okay with that. Because the miracle then is an entire army of Egypt drowned in ankle-deep water. Pick your miracle, okay? I'm good with either one of them. I'm good with both of them. Maybe it was only ankle-deep and God stood it up this tall instead of, you know, that tall. I'm good with either one of them or both. But the Jordan River, just as they had to cross the Red Sea to get out of Egypt, and they did that by faith in a God who led them, then by faith, we cross the Jordan River into dependence upon God. You see, we're not saved by faith and kept by works. This is not a confusing relationship. By faith, we start. By faith, we continue. And at the moment that God chooses, not a pandemic, not a war, not a vaccine, at the time God chooses, he calls us home. And how does Paul describe that moment? I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have what? I have kept the faith. The only way we fight the good fight and the only way we finish the course is the same way we started the journey. By faith. But what is it that disrupts our faith? That was the challenges faced by the nation of Israel at the banks of the Jordan River the first time they were there. The banks of the Jordan River would have been a good time for the spies in all of Israel to have reflected on the evidence of God's faithfulness in their past 40 plus or less days. God wasn't asking them to show blind faith in a God that hadn't done anything for them. Think about what God has done for them in just the past month and a half. And, and by the way, just a quick side note, if you were to go read Exodus 5, Exodus 14, Exodus 15, Exodus 16, Exodus 17, this is all from the time that, that Pharaoh said, pack up your belongings and leave, and the time they arrived at the Jordan River the first time. This takes place all in that period of time, less than a month and a half. And five times, in five chapters, it says, and the people grumbled. They'd been set free from slavery, and they grumbled. And here's what happens. Every time they grumbled, God took care of them. And some of you are about to say, well, dang, I ought to grumble a whole lot more then. Here's the point. They were babies. What do we do with whining, sniveling babies? We coddle them. We care for them. We make sure their diaper's dry. We make sure their tummy is full. We make sure they burped. Okay? And we coddle and care for them. But what do you do when they get to be just a tad bit older and they still whine? You see, we don't discipline infants. We nurture infants. We discipline children. There comes a moment in which God the Father says, you're too old. You're still on the milk of the Word. You ought to be on the meat of the Word. You're too old for me to coddle anymore. Now it's time for me to discipline you. And that's what happens later. at the ban That's what happens in a very brief period of time at the Jordan River. God said again and again and again, I've cared for you, I've cared for you, I've cared for you. Now all you have to do is make the same choice you made to cross the Red Sea and you can cross the Jordan River and enter into the good of all of my promises. And they discovered that day in their own minds because of fear that it was better to go back than it was to advance forward. You see, here's what they should have reflected on on the riverbank that day. 
that in the last 45 days, they've watched God, through 10 plagues, change Pharaoh's mind, and he set them free. In the last 45 days, all of them had watched God stand up the Red Sea on top of itself and then drown the entire Egyptian army. That's Exodus 13. Three verses. A after they crossed the Red Sea and all of the Egyptian army was wiped out, Moses said, let's set up camp. We don't have to worry about the enemy sneaking up on us anymore. And he set up camp. And three verses after they crossed the Red Sea, do you know what God does? He puts this big giant cloud right out in front of them. And he says, until you get to the land of promise, you will know my presence by that cloud by day, and I'll make that cloud light up like a big fire at night. And you won't have to worry about my presence with you wherever you go. You won't have to worry about how far to travel today because I'll move and when I stop it, you stop. And when I move, you move. You don't have to worry about, I'll do the heavy lifting, God says. All you got to do is follow me. They've seen that every day. If they by chance forgot about God today, what did they need to do? Simply look up. Would you and I go through part of a day and we forget to think about God? What do you think we might ought to do? Look up, and if that doesn't work, look in, because where does he live now? He's no longer a cloud out there in front of us. He is his very life living within us. Uh, then, then the next day, Exodus 15, they come, they come to the waters of Marah. You know what the word Marah means? It means bitter. They come to a place of water, they're thirsty, they're in a wilderness, and they all get ready to drink, and the water's bitter. doesn't mean it's bad, it's just bitter. And you know what they do? Yeah, they grumble. You know what Moses does? God, <laughs> just smote them now. <laughs> what do you want me to do? God says, God says, find a chunk of wood and toss it in. What good's a chunk of wood going to do? That piece of wood makes your bitter life and my bitter life sweet. And the chunk of wood Moses threw in made the waters of Mara sweet. They get satisfied with water, then what do they complain about? <laughs> How are we going to eat, our God? How are we gonna, the Egyptians fed us. How are we going to eat? God said, no problem. And he dropped down in light rain, manna from heaven. You know what manna means? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pastor Andrew knows. It doesn't mean bread. It doesn't mean flaky bread. It doesn't mean dry bread. It doesn't mean bread from heaven. It means, what is it? That's probably what all the children of Israel said when they looked out their tents and they saw all this bread coming down. They said, what is it? It's man, God provided for the needs. And then, okay, God, I, we're not vegetarians here. You're just feeding us bread. We need a little something more. So what does God do? Quail come flooding in, and they eat quail, Exodus 16. And then they go on a little farther, and they're thirsty again. And what do they do? They whine and complain, and they come to a big rock out in the middle of the desert, and God says, hit the rock. That's a picture of Christ. He's the rock of our salvation, and he is the river of living water that comes flowing out, and he provided for their needs. And then, and then they go a little further, and they come across an enemy, the Amalekites. Now, there's an interesting verse, and I'm running out of time. There's an interesting verse. I think it's back in Exodus 13. Yeah, here it is. They, they just crossed the Red Sea, and God says, hey, Moses, come here a minute. He said, we can't take them on the shortest route to Canaan. If you take them on the shortest route, listen to what he says. There's a lot of enemies in Philistine country. If they face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. God knew that babies weren't ready to fight. God knew their character wasn't ready to fight. Let's go a different way. And they go a different way, and they avoid the Philistines and some other nasty folks out there. But... Before they get to the River Jordan, they do come across the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are winning. And Moses prays, and God says, hey, Moses, put your hands up. You want a good reason to raise your hands during a hymn? And please, you know, I'm Baptist. I can only raise one hand, and only about this high. Okay, I got alligator arms. <laughs> I've, I've gotten past that. But hey, you want a good reason to raise your hands in worship? It's because it's a sign of victory. 
It's a sign that you understand the victory of God in your life. It's what it was for Moses that day in the wilderness. God said, Moses, raise your hands. Keep your hands up towards me. You're, you're, you're pointing my direction, and I will give victory to the, to the army. And as long as Moses kept his hands up, they were winning. If his arms got tired, arms got tired, and they went down, then the Amalekites started winning. And this kind of went back and forth for a while. And then his brother Aaron and another buddy of Aaron's decided, you know what, we better get him something to sit out on so we can keep his hands up longer. And they got him a rock to sit on. And then he still got tired keeping his hands up in the air. And they said, okay, you take one side, I'll take the other. And they held his hands up. And God gave victory to the Israelites. They hadn't fought a battle in 400 years. And they won their first one. And then Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Oh, my goodness. And then the second time the Ten Commandments come back down, the face of Moses is radiant, so radiant. They said, Moses, cover your face. We can't stand to look at you. I've had folks say, I can't stand to look at you, but it's never because of my radiance. Here's the deal. All 12 spies were privy to God's sufficiency over these past 45 days. Plagues. Red Sea, pillar of fire, waters at Marah, manna, quail, water from a rock, victory over the Amalekites, Ten Commandments, radiant face of Moses. How much do you need for God to do in your life in less than two months for you to make a good decision at the banks of the River Jordan? And yet, and yet, the Scripture says the heart of the people melted in fear and they chose to go back instead of forward. We were brought out in order to be brought in, not to go back. The wilderness now becomes the place. It's no longer the place of transition. It's now the place of discipline because fear, fear was more influential than faith. The wilderness this time is a picture of what the New Testament describes as a carnal Christian. That's a, that's a horrible sound. It's kind of like saying casket. I don't like the word casket. I try to find another word. Carnal Christian is an ugly word in my vocabulary. But the Bible uses it. And if you are a carnal Christian, it means you have been redeemed by faith in Jesus Christ who was reconciled in death on the cross. You've received the Holy Spirit by whose gracious presence Christ now lives in each of us. But we have chosen to live in spite of all that God has done for us in self-imposed poverty under the subtle influences of a defeated enemy called our flesh which Christ took care of when he went to the grave. You are just like the children of Israel who live for 40 years, plagued by the memories of the subtle influences of an enemy whom God buried to the very last man in the depths of the Red Sea. You as they neither enjoy the flesh pots of Egypt, of, of slavery to sin. No, because you know why? As Christians, we can't really enjoy sin like we used to because there's conviction that comes with it now. Nor do we enjoy milk and honey of Canaan. We are dumped in the desert. Christ disciplined them for 40 years until an unbelieving generation died off, never stepping foot in the promised land. The actual trip, maybe 40 days, now corresponds to 40 years. Remember, God's original plan for Israel was to take, take them into the promised land in days, not decades. How long is it taking God to get you to his place of promise? The Jordan River the second time, and we'll pick up here next week, is a place of second chances and do-overs. And the prerequisite hasn't changed. It is still faith and faith alone to claim the promise. 2021 finds us on the banks of a river. What are we going to do? Will we learn from the lessons of our past and be strengthened in our faith and our confidence in Christ? Will we still be controlled by our problems or our pandemics or our fears of the future? Or will we boldly step into a river and enter into all of the goodness that God has for us? With this, I'll close. Rodney Buchanan wrote a book called From Death to Life. And he tells this story. He says, a few years ago, a canoeing friend of mine and I went to a talk one evening at the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation Center. That's in Ohio, outside of Cleveland, I believe. I could hardly wait to hear the couple that was about to speak. It was Verlin and Valerie Kruger. They had recently completed, are you ready for this? They completed a 21,000-mile trip by canoe. I'm not even sure how to do my arms in a canoe. I, I had read about this amazing couple Buchanan says, but I did not know until the lecture that they were Christians. 
They began at the top of Canada, and they wound their way through the country to the Great Lakes. On down through the United States, they paddled until the Mississippi River dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. They continued down the western side of Florida, and then they went through the Keys and across the ocean to South America. They paddled down the Amazon until, other re until they hit other rivers heading south. They were on in that canoe for 33 months. 21,000 miles, 16 million canoe strokes later, they came out at Cape Horn. I'm tired just telling you the story. There were times when they paddled for 55 straight hours. They had a lot of adventures and wonderful stories to tell, and I sat spellbound. They told of the ice that formed on their canoes and also on their bodies as they went through an ice storm in Lake Superior. They told of the floods on the Amazon as well as about huge snakes and alligators. But one story stuck in Buchanan's mind. He said they were in South America. And just as they rounded a bend in the river, they came across this huge flock of black swans. When the birds saw them, they went into complete panic and they began to flap their wings while they ran across the top of the water. They were going downriver. The Krugers chased those screaming birds for miles, not because they wanted to, but because the birds were running from them on the top of the water. To their amazement, only a few of the swan dared to turn, face them, and fly over them. Even though the swans were created to fly, they chose to run and scream. Valerie said, I learned something very valuable from those swans. We must face our fears if we're going to get over them. If we run from them, they will chase us our entire life. But if we turn and face them, we will learn that we can fly by the grace of God. Isaiah said, sometimes God gives us the strength to mount up with wings as eagles. I think this is a moment that the church of Jesus Christ needs to fly. We must let God literally be the wind beneath our wings. Well, I tell you what, Tim and team, you couldn't have picked a better set of songs for today's sermon. I invite you, if you'd like to turn to the book of Joshua chapter 1, it's where we'll be reading from in, uh, in just a few minutes. If you'll recall, we're engaged in a sermon series called Riverbank Reflections. We're uh, spending some time along the banks of the Jordan River, and we're learning some lessons that may have a bearing on the way in which you and I live life today. Um, two weeks ago, we started this series, and I would encourage you, if you have missed one of the first two sermons, take a little time this coming week and go to the website and watch it, because this is a series that builds precept upon precept and truth upon truth and don't have time to do exhaustive review each week. So just the highlights in that very first week, I, uh, I gave you seven questions. And then last week, I, uh, week before, I sent them out in an email and we made hard copies and had for you last Sunday. And if you didn't get those, um, I got nothing for you this week. Uh, <laughs> You could text me and we'll resend them to you, or you can write them down real quick. And you, there might be a few left sitting out on the foyer, I'm not sure. But here are the soul-searching, life-shaping questions that I want us to ask ourselves at this particular unique time in history. We are a generation unlike any other generation in over 115 years. We are getting a chance to look back at how we survived and weathered and were victorious or failed through a pandemic. Not since the generation of 1912 have we done that. And so you and I get a chance today, just still on the edge of it, still hanging on, we have a chance to look back and evaluate our own life. Forget about checking out the presidents and how they've done Forget about how the governors have handled all their situations or our local, our, our local county health departments. That, that's not the purpose of this. This is nothing political or governmental at all. This is personal. This is a chance for you and I to look in the mirror of God's Word and ask ourselves some very serious questions and learn lessons from how we went through it, whether they're good lessons or bad. God gives us an opportunity, and the Jordan River is a wonderful place in the Bible for us to discover this from. God gives us second chances. He gives us do-overs. He gives us fresh starts and new beginnings. 
And so the children of Israel are brought back to the banks of the Jordan River a second time after they messed up 40 years before. You and I have a chance to learn, not only from biblical history, but from our own recent history. And so these seven questions, remember, you're not to answer them for anybody else. You don't answer them for a spouse, a child, a parent. You don't answer them for anybody else but yourself. And don't justify yourself. Okay? This is, this is honesty with you and God. And here were the seven questions. During this past year, did the culture shape my faith? Or did my faith in God shape my response to the culture? Number two, did my faith in and dependence on Jesus Christ grow during this last year? Is it stronger than before March of 2020? Or have I become more independent from Jesus? And as a result, my faith has been weakened. Number three, did I enjoy and experience greater faith or was I frustrated, manipulated more often by fear? Did I find myself frustrated by trying to fit my faith into the circumstances I was living in or did I rest in my faith as I went through the circumstances? Number five, did I invent this, investigate the scriptures more or less than the evening news, the daily news networks, Facebook? What or who impacted your life more during the past 15 months, science or scripture, politicians or pastors, family or Fauci, who or the Holy Spirit, CDC press releases or Old Testament, New Testament scriptures, and church sermons? Number six, has corporate worship, the gathering of the faith family, become more a matter of convenience than conscience, comfort than commitment, self-centered rather than Christ-focused? Number seven, am I prepared for the what-ifs that will come in my future because of what I have learned in my past? And so those were the seven questions. And then we spent last week looking at the story of the children of Israel and their freedom from Egypt, which remember is a picture of our freedom today from the control of sin in our life. It's the picture of, of being a sinner and crossing the Red Sea is a picture of our redemption, new birth in Christ. And then they went through the wilderness, which is a transition period of time of being a baby Christian to having some time to grow up in our faith so we're ready to enter into the full of the promises that God had for us, just as God promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joshua and all of Israel, a nation, a place to live called Canaan land, a place filled with promise for them. And then the River Jordan, a picture of continuing on. Just as we began the Christian life, so continue. How did you cross the Red Sea? By faith. How do you cross the River Jordan? By faith. And Paul says the same thing in the New Testament. Just as you began your life of faith, now continue. And sometimes we come to the banks of the Jordan River and we hear about what's on the other side, all the promises and all the good stuff that's there, but we also hear about trouble and we hear about enemies and giants. And instead of pressing on with faith, we tend to go back. It's just easier to hang out in the wilderness than it is to press on in faith. And that's what we spent our time looking at last week, those, those correlations of a historical story to contemporary Christian living. We referred to that. Do you remember what we call that when we look at a historical event from a, a contemporary personal perspective? Somebody said it? Allegory, yeah. We call that an allegory. It's a word that Paul used uh, in the New Testament when he said these things, referring back to Old Testament history, he said these things are written as an allegory. An allegory, the picture of one thing in the image of another. What we do, and I've kind of amplified on that this week, is we look at a Bible story, which is historically accurate, in order to discover a spiritual principle, which is biblically appropriate, with the hope of discovering a life-changing truth that is personally applicable. You see, that's the purpose of studying the Scriptures, quite frankly, folks, is we want to understand why God said what He said and why God recorded what He recorded in the Scripture. We want to find not only the accuracy of its history, but we also want to discover a principle that is there for us to learn from. But it's not enough to know the history and understand the principle until we make that third step, and that is personally applying what we have learned to our own lives, then do you know where we'll live, folks? We'll live in the wilderness. 
will never cross the Jordan River and enter into the good of the fullness of all that God has for you and me. You see, the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt was only for the purpose of preparing them for the enjoyment of living in Canaan. Canaan was the goal to which God was leading his children. The abundant life that Jesus talks about in the Gospel of John, I have come to give you life and life, what? More abundant. And we've talked about it here before, but in case you're new, that abundant life is not summarized in Rolls Royces and, and what do you call fancy? Rolexes, all right? I get confused between Rolex and Lexuses, okay? I've owned neither, so I'm confused by both of them. But, but it, it has nothing to do with the accumulation of stuff in this world. It has to do, the life more abundant, has to do with living in the fullness of all the promises that Jesus extends to us. Those promises of rest for a weary soul. Those promises of peace for a troubled mind. Those promises of joy for the seasons of discouragement we go to. The the the. the, the the kicker of all promises, for me anyway, is found in Philippians chapter 4. When from a prison cell, Paul writes these words, I have learned. I finally crossed the River Jordan after I learned this. I have learned, no matter what's going on around me, to be content in any and every situation. Why? Because I can do all things. I can endure anything through the strength of Christ who lives in me. Folks, that's crossing the Jordan. We're not talking about heaven. We're talking about living in the goodness of all that Jesus is in the here and now at this moment. We are brought out in order to be brought in. The purpose of God for bringing us out was not to make us wilderness wanderers all of our lives. So let's jump in. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Here's what the Scripture says. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. How would you like to be Joshua following Moses as pastor? I mean, Charlton Heston coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. And God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And folks, just in case you don't know it, just as he was with Moses, just as he was with Joshua, so will he be with you. That's true. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to the ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Notice something it doesn't, says, it doesn't say. It doesn't say be fearless. It does not say be fearless. Do not misunderstand anything I've been saying the last two weeks. I am not saying that you will never have fear in your life. You will face fear probably just about every day that you live. John Wayne was not a very good theologian, I don't think, but he got this one thing right. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is being afraid and saddling up anyway. If you're not fearful, there's no need for courage. Courage is the choices we make in the face and in the circumstances of a very fearful situation. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Don't waver in your commitment to Christ. Keep this book always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Commanded you what? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let me give you some context of this Old Testament book of Joshua. This book describes the conquest of the land of Canaan. 
They are at the banks of the Jordan River. This is the second time. Last week we looked extensively at the first time where they failed miserably. And we'll find out again if you weren't here last week why they failed miserably the first time. But this book is really about Joshua who is the successor to Moses. And I find it interesting that the name Joshua in Hebrew literally means the Lord saves. The Lord is salvation. And do you know what the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua is? Jesus, yeah. Anytime a preacher asks you a question, 90% of the time the answer will always be, yeah, that's right. And it's true here, all right? Joshua, Jesus, same name. I find that fascinating. That's why this allegory is so beautiful. And notice what God said to Joshua. And this is not the only time in Scripture that God said, be strong, be courageous, do not be discouraged, do not be afraid. He said it dozens of times throughout the Old and New Testament. And do you know what? Every time God said, be strong, do you know who he was talking to? He was talking to somebody who felt weak. He wasn't talking to a strong guy and telling them to be strong. He was talking to a weak person, telling them, hey, don't make decisions based upon your weakness. Make decisions based upon my strength. God said, be courageous. Do you know who he was talking to at that moment? Every single time he was talking to somebody who was frightened. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, what's the first words out of their mouth? Don't be afraid. (laughs) Why were they saying that? Because the people were terrified. But don't be afraid. Why? Because God is with you. God says to Joshua here, do not be discouraged, which meant that God was talking to a person who was ready to quit their job. You ever been fit to quit? God says, hang in there. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be discouraged. You see, human weakness and human fear and human discouragement is overcome by dependence upon God's promise and upon God's person. Just like Jesus in the garden. Jesus as man, God the Son, never ever less than God, but never ever more than man. And Jesus in all of his humanity, the night of his betrayal, hours before he would be beaten, thrown in jail, and then a day or two before his own crucifixion, Jesus in all of his humanity comes to his Father with his human weakness, with his human fear, and with his human disillusionment. And on his knees alone in the garden, he says, Father, could you get me out of this jam? Could you let this cup pass from me? And the only good but I've ever found in Scripture is the next sentence. But, not my will but yours be done. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be discouraged. When we grasp this text, we understand the story of the Israelites and their previous 40-year journey in the desert, wandering around because the last time they came to the banks of the river, they grumbled. Guess what? They did it the second time too. But the first time they grumbled and disobeyed. The idea of coming to the promised land parallels the New Testament concept of being saved. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, by which, the grace of God, you are being saved if you hold fast the word that I've preached to you. Here's the terminology we often use in church. When we're born again, we often refer to that as, hey, I got what last week? I got, we talk about it in the past tense. That's true about redemption, I got redeemed last week. I got born again last week. That is a once and done event in our life. Okay? Salvation isn't once and done. It is present progressive. Check out what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. I am being saved. Present progressive tense. It starts at my new birth, but the process continues every moment of every day throughout my life. The children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, their moment of redemption. As they walked those three to nine months through the wilderness, they were being saved. God was strengthening their faith by giving them manna from heaven, water from a rock, quail out of the wind, and he was showing them that he was a God who was faithful. So when they got to the banks of the Jordan River, they could continue being saved and enter into the good of the fullness of all that God had for them. 
But instead of remembering all that God had done, as we sung about in one of the, the worship hymns this morning, instead of remembering what God had done, we became fearful by what looked like to be an enemy that we could not handle. And they turned and they went back. Some background on Joshua. He had worked with Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. He had served without Moses throughout all the wilderness wanderings. He had become a, a strong leader along with Moses. He was full of faith and had lots of courage even in fearful moments. If you went to Sunday school as a kid, you'll remember that it was Joshua and Caleb who were two of the 12 spies that believed that God could help them to conquer the land the first time they were there. But the story of the 10 spies had more influence on the congregation known as the children of Israel, than the two did. Folks, the majority is not always right. That's why you and I must interpret things not from what seems to be approved by most, but what is approved by God. Many of that generation, in fact, all of Joshua and Caleb's generation died in the wilderness. You see that fear brings death, but faith gives life. We put faith in Christ and we live in spite of the circumstances. Put our trust in anything other than Jesus and we shrivel up and we die. We, we might have enough faith to get us out of Egypt, but we don't have enough faith that believes that Jesus can take us all the way into the promised land. Guys, if you're living in the wilderness right now, I want you to look for God to show up in a way that you can't explain because his ways are not our ways. He showed up to Moses in a burning bush. He showed up to the people of Israel in the wilderness through a staff of Moses. He showed up with water out of a rock. He showed with, with quail out of a windstorm. He showed up again and again and again to show himself sufficient for their needs. God will show up again and again in your life, but you've got to have the eyes to see and the mind that wants to see his activity in your life and your world. Folks, today's message is for all of us. You see, the question is going to be answered by kings and presidents, by rich or poor, we will all answer the question, will we live by fear or will we live by faith? Let me talk about one thing that fear really costs us. The one thing that I want to point out that fear will cost us as it did the children of Israel. You see, fear is what keeps us from living and it robs us of time. Do you realize the nation of Israel wasted 40 years in the wilderness? The kingdom impact of the children of Israel and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was put on hold for 40 years in its influence in the world. You see, all that Israel could see were the enemies on the other side. But you know what? Some of those folks who were part of those other nations in the foreign land, they would have loved to have known the God of Israel who brings you out of Egypt and gives you a promise. Oh, I know if you read it, it sounds like God wanted to slaughter all those people all the time. But go back and really study your history. He only wanted to slaughter those who were going to be instrumental in leading his people away from him as God. Go check the lineage of Jesus Christ and see if you find some other folks who had a different nationality besides being a Jew. And you'll find that there were proselytes to the Hebrew faith. Because the faith in God was not limited to Hebrews alone. That's why it's not limited to any particular nationality or country here today. The truth of who God is and the promises that God offers is available to all of us, whether we get a tan in Hawaii or we don't get a tan in Hawaii. It's available to all of us. And Do you realize that if the children of Israel had gone in, you know, Israel was fearful of what they heard about was going on inside the promised land. When we come back to this story of Joshua, do you understand the people who lived in the promised land were fearful of the God of Israel? But for 40 years, they had nothing to worry about because the children wandered in fear rather than faith. Time is stolen from us. Numbers that we read last week, 
Chapter 13 reports the first exploration, those 12 spies, and we spent a great deal of time of looking at that last week. But just something I, I failed to mention is when those 12 spies came back and reported to the whole assembly, they not only gave a report, but they brought back evidence of what a grand place the promised land was. The scripture says they showed them the fruit of the land. Here's my question today, guys. Are you and I as the children of God in the 21st century, are we showing to the world the fruit of God's promises in our lives? Are we showing folks who went through a COVID-19 culture in the year 2020 the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, kindness, against such there is no law? Are we showing them the evidence of what it means to live in the fullness of all of God's promises? They gave Moses an account. We went into land. It flows with milk and honey. Here's the evidence. But, but, this is the ugly but of Scripture. But, the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified. We can not do this. That was fear talking. But then Caleb, he silenced the crowd. And he said to Moses, we should go up and take possession now. We certainly can do this. That was faith talking. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't. They're stronger than we are, and they spread a bad report. In verse 33, it says, we saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak from the Nephilim, and we seem like grasshoppers. Have you read that verse closely? It wasn't the children of Israel saying we look like grasshoppers in the eyes of those giants. Wouldn't that make sense? That's not what the Scripture says. It says those ten spies said we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. If you see yourself defeated by the enemy, you're living the life of a grasshopper. If you see yourself enjoying the victory that Christ has paid for you, then we live like giants in the land of faith. Twelve men took the same trip. Two different views. Two groups of people. The first group in these spies was a visionary group, and the second group was a stationary group. You see, visionary means they have vision or foresight. Stationary means not moving or unchanging. Visionary defined by a biblical perspective is a person who sees what can be done by God and we have a passion to do it. Let me ask you, which group would you fall in? The ten who were stationary or the two who were visionary? We see what can be done by God and we have a passion to do it. Folks, I, I'm not talking, as I mentioned last week, about baseless faith. One of the songs that, that the team led us in this morning, and in fact, I, let me see if I, didn't, if I didn't lose it, it's on my phone, because I can't trust my memory anymore. Yeah, this song here. Don't forget the things he's done before, and remember he can do it all once more. Yeah, that's what the children of Israel had for them as they stood at the banks the first time. Don't forget what God has just done in your life. He can do it again as you cross over. God, whatever, folks, whatever victories God has done in your life in the past, don't forget them because he can do it again if you'll let him. It's not baseless faith. It's a growing faith based on what God has already done, and it's trusting in self-sufficiency. And Caleb said, let's go at once. And let's, let's claim what God has already secured for us. But all the enemies were big. And folks, those enemies just didn't exist in the Old Testament. Those enemies exist today and the challenges that you and I face. Paul talks about that in the book of Ephesians, all right? As he writes a letter to the New Testament church, to those believers saved by grace because of faith in Jesus Christ who now have what Moses and Joshua didn't have going for them. We now have the presence of Jesus Christ himself living in us. Do you understand that? As a Christian, every moment of life that you live and every place that you set your foot, you are not alone. He is in you at that moment. Are you going to live in ignorance of him or in dependence upon him? I don't care if you're young or old. 
life is treating you good or bad right now, here's what Paul said. In the reality of the fullness of Christ living in me as I live out the promises in this world, here's the challenges I face. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we have to do battle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness that is found in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil days and having done all, stand. Chapter 14, verse 6, Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke out to the whole congregation. He said, guys, wake up! Don't listen to the majority. Come on, guys. The land we pass through, it's good land. The Lord delights in us. He will bring us to the land and give it to us, and it will flow with milk and honey. You know, it's amazing how many things in our daily lives result because of somebody else's vision. We drive cars today because somebody had the vision for a vehicle. We use computers today uh, because somebody had a vision for um, smartphones. We fly in planes because somebody had the vision of flying high. Helen Keller, who was blind, said the worst, there's something worse than being blind, and it's being able to see and having no vision. Woodrow Wilson, though not one of the best presidents who ever served, said we grow great by dreams. All big men are dreamers. The poorest person is the one who is without a cent. But he, let me say that correctly. The poorest person is not the one who is without a cent, but the one without a dream. You see what the church needs today, what God needs for kingdom influence in the world today are people who see the invisible and hear the inaudible and believe the incredible and think the unthinkable. That's what, that's what Hebrew says about Moses in 1127, by faith. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, persevered, as seeing him who is invisible. You and I need to remember the line out of one of the songs. Again, we sang earlier today, God, you made a way when there was no way. Do it again. You've never failed me yet. Those ten spies also spread a bad report, and that spreaded fear throughout the people. Do you allow, you see, fear and faith influence Fear influences more fear. Faith influences more faith. What's our life doing? Let me wrap this up. The promise that God made to Joshua, God is making those same promises to you and me today. The question is, will we believe him? You see, God told Joshua, nobody will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Who could defeat Joshua when he was on God's side? The answer is no one. When you and I have Jesus living in us, who can wrestle salvation away from us? Who can steal our peace? Who can take away our promise of heaven? Who can do that? Do you know the answer? No one. Say it out loud. No one. There is no other who can take that from us. The Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God's commandment to Joshua is our commandment today. God's promise to Joshua is our promise today. And folks, how do we live this kind of life? Verses 7 and 8 of Joshua chapter 1, it tells us, keep this book always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Learn God's word, know God's truth, and obey God's command. Not only did this, is this said in Joshua, but it's said in Psalm 128, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. John said it in his second epistle, verse 6, And this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. As you had heard from the beginning, so walk in love. Guys, let's not lose any more time. Let's not be another casualty for the next 40 years because of fear. Let's choose faith over fear, peace over anxiety, hope over despair. If you're tired of fear and anxiety having a grip in your life, make a choice. Let God handle these issues. It's not that we won't be fearful and it's not that we won't be anxious, but let's allow faith to overcome those things in our life. Let's thank Jesus for giving to us His peace, His courage, His strength. Folks, if you're a believer, you don't have to ask Jesus to give you strength. You don't have to ask Jesus to give you peace. 
You don't have to ask Jesus to give you courage. You already have those things. Because where does Jesus live if you're a Christian? He lives in you. Is Jesus peaceful? Is Jesus courageous? Is Jesus strong? Then I don't need to ask him to give me what he's already given. I need to thank him and let it become real in my life. I'll wrap it up. There was a mother who had a little four-year-old daughter who was preparing to go to bed for the evening. The child was very fearful of the night, the dark. She always wanted a nightlight on, but sometimes it would go off. She would often want to sleep in the same room with her mama. Because the child's fear was so great, the mother also was fearful for the child. When the light was out, and the child caught a glimpse of the moon outside the window, and she said, Mama, is the moon God's light? Mom said, yeah, yeah, honey, it is. God's lights are always shining. The next question was, will, will God blow out his light and go to sleep? No, my child, God never sleeps. Then out of the simplicity of childlike faith, that little girl said, that which gave great reassurance to her fearful mother, well, Mom, as long as God is awake, I'm not afraid. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains where my strength comes from. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you and me, he does not slumber. Indeed, the one who watches over his people will neither slumber nor sleep. Folks, he won't even do what some of y'all do in church. He won't nod off, not for a second, not one second, so we can be faith-filled rather than fear-filled. Let's do it. Well, good morning and happy Father's Day. Glad you're with us today. As you know, we're involved in this series uh, called Riverbank Reflections. We find ourselves at a unique point in time in history, something that very few generations have had the opportunity to do, and that is uh, survive a pandemic and take the occasion to look back and see how we did as we went through it. Um, and not just as citizens of the U.S., but more importantly, as citizens of the kingdom of God. You and I as children need to take seriously this particular moment in time. We need to look back, and we need to examine how well did we go through this last year? What was our faith like over these last 15 months? And we don't need to be afraid of what the answers are. We may not like what we see. We may look back and say, wow, I could have done some things a whole lot differently. I could have done some things where my faith would have been strengthened and my faith would have been more evident to others. But don't let that discourage you. Riverbank moments are an occasion for us to look back to prepare us to move forward. That's what this is all about, is learning lessons from the past, both the failure and success. And no better place to look than the riverbank of the Jordan River. For the riverbank of the Jordan River was a place of failure. And 40 years later, it became a place of victory. And so if you and I look back and see that, hey, maybe, maybe our spiritual life didn't do too well last year, but we're back at the banks of the river again this year, and we can make some different decisions because of what we've learned from the past. God, God loves to give us fresh starts and new beginnings. And this is an opportunity for us to do that, and He wants us to never forget the past because those lessons are valuable for us as we step into the future. And so three weeks ago when we started the series, and we'll wrap it up at least for the time being next Sunday, but... Uh, we, we kick this off by giving you seven questions, and we've provided them for you verbally in every sermon. We did handouts a week or so. They've been on Facebook. They've been, uh, they've been sent out in email. I'm going to hit those seven questions again, and I've given this challenge every time I've given the seven questions. You're only to answer these questions for yourself. These are self-reflective questions. These are not for you to look at how somebody else measured up to these questions. You and the Spirit of God in you and the Word of God in front of you is all that you're to deal with. 
This is not about you to make some judgment about somebody else. It is about for you and God to ask yourself these questions and the light of His Word come up with some answers. And the other, the other warning that I gave to you is beware of self-justification. We try to make ourselves look better in our own eyes, and if we tell ourselves a lie long enough about ourselves, we believe it. Uh, let, me, let me drive that point home. How many of you men played, and, and I'm going to be sexist for a moment, all right? Forgive me, but I came out of the 70s, all right? So how many of you men played sports in high school? Okay. How many of you played sports better in high school now than you did when you were in high school? <laughs> we ran faster and jumped higher and hit harder than we ever did in reality. Well, we do that same thing in our spiritual lives. We tell the story over and over long enough, we begin to believe it must be true about ourselves. So here's the seven questions. I'm going to go through them quickly, not give much dialogue. We've done that in the past. But number one, did the culture of this past year shape my faith, or did my faith shape my response to the culture? Did my faith in and my dependence on Jesus grow? Is it stronger now than it was before March of 2020? Or have I become more independent from Jesus? And as a result, my faith in Him has been weakened during this time. Question three, did I enjoy and experience greater faith, or was I frustrated and manipulated more by fear? Number four, did I find myself frustrated by trying to fit my faith into the circumstances, or did I rest in my faith as I went through those circumstances? Number five, did I investigate the Scriptures more or less than news networks and Facebook? What or who impacted my life during the past 15 months? Science or Scripture? Politicians or pastors? Family or Fauci? Who or the Holy Spirit? CDC releases or Old Testament, New Testament Scripture and messages? Number six, has corporate worship, what we're sharing in today, gathering with the faith family, has that become more a matter of convenience than conscience, of comfort than commitment, self-centeredness rather than Christ's focus? And number seven, Am I better prepared now for the what-ifs that will come in the future than I was in the past? And remember, it is not a sin to use human means to solve our problems. It is not a sin to take a vaccine. It is okay to get a shot, all right? Uh, it's your choice. It's okay not to get a shot. It is your choice to wear a mask during all this or not to wear a mask. It's not a sin to do either one of those. It is not a sin to socially distance, okay? None of these human solutions to this current problem that we went through, none of those things are sin. But what is sin is for you and I to trust in those things more than we do in God. What is a sin is to think that human ways are better than God's ways or to leave God completely out of the problem-solving process. That is a serious mistake, and that is choosing to be independent from God, which is ultimately what the biggest sin is. As we kicked off this series before we got to the banks of the Jordan River in the book of Joshua, we spent a little time in the book of Jeremiah chapter 17. It is there that we found the words of the prophets that says, this is what the Lord says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. The person who does that is like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by where? By the water, the rivers, Okay? that sends out its roots into the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. That's good news on a day like today, isn't it? It leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought or pandemic, and it never fails to bear fruit. And then this prophet gives us a warning. The heart, it is deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. Who can understand this? And then verse 10 I, the Lord, I search your heart and I examine your mind. Why, Lord? To reward each person according to their conduct and the deeds they deserve. 
Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. I think Joshua would have liked that last song that Rose just sang for us. Dead man walking, though six feet under. Joshua was being called upon to fill the sandals of a guy by the name of Moses. Joshua probably felt like he wasn't up to the task. And the Lord says to him, rise up, Moses. I've got a purpose for your life. And the question I want us to consider today is how can I be the person that God chooses to use? It's a great Father's Day question for every man. But quite frankly, it's a great question for every believer to ask. God, what kind of person do you choose to use? And you might feel like the one line of that song, I'm a dead man walking. The circumstances of my life, what I've been through as a result of this pandemic, all of the chaos that have been created over this past year in my world, I feel like I'm buried under six feet of dirt and junk and stuff. There's no way to recover. Very possibly exactly how Joshua felt. Let's read these nine verses. Follow along with me if you would, please. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you, Joshua, and all of these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them. To the Israelites, I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, I will be with you. Your territory will extend from the desert and from Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all of the days of your life. Boy, isn't that good news for a guy who felt like he was buried under a problem? He's now being told by God himself, don't sweat. <laughs> You'll have victory everywhere you go. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to the forefathers and I gave to them. Number two, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. The third time, do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. In Joshua chapter 1, God said, be strong. And usually when God says that, he's talking to a person who feels very weak. God says, be courageous, which means he's probably talking to a person who is terribly frightened. God said, don't be discouraged, which means the person he's talking to probably is greatly discouraged. Ever sound like you? Weak, fearful, discouraged? You're just the kind of person God can use. When we feel like God comes by, he'll lift us up by saying, you're the person I need. Joshua, replacing Moses, he probably felt at that moment like Barney Fife trying to replace Charlton Heston. You'll probably have to explain to her who Barney Fife and Charlton Heston is, all right? She probably has no idea about either one of those. Um, do you know Charlton Heston played Moses in a movie called The Ten Commandments? He was an actor. Barney Fife, he was the sheriff and Andy Griffith. All right? So, all right. Not that that explanation made any more sense than the original statement, but it tells you I'm getting old to be doing this. All right? There's a story told of a pilot who was flying a four-passenger plane when the engine began to have some problems. Unfortunately, there was only one parachute on board the plane. So the pilot took the parachute, went to the door, turned to the four passengers and said, don't panic, I'm going for help. <laughs> and that's probably kind of how Joshua felt at that particular moment. Moses, my servant, is dead, and you the man, Joshua. You're the guy who will do what Moses couldn't do. You'll lead the children of Israel into the land that I promised them. Most of us, and may God forgive us, and he does, but most of us, when we first come to Christ, we are often too big to be of use to God. 
we are too full of our own schemes, our own ideas, our own successes, our own personality. We want to do things our own way that God finds no room in our life to be who He wants to be in us. God has to humble us and break us and empty us of ourself. It doesn't come naturally to us to die to self. If you've been around New Hope very long, you know I invited Christ to my life when I was five years old at Hume Lake Christian Camp. Third Thursday of June, 1960. Never forget that night. But I was about um, 26 and a half years old. So it's 21 years later that I was broken enough where God could begin to start to do something in my life. I just just become part of the pastoral staff at the church in Fresno that eventually merged here. And Dad was not yet retired, but he was tired. He had a rough couple of years towards the end. and I was so excited. I'd just been ordained and thought things were going great. And in a moment just like that, fuss broke out in the church. My best friend, who was the closest thing I had to a brother, didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. Some others walked away. I laid in bed, only been married a little over a year, and I laid in bed in an upstairs apartment. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I said, God, if this is what ministry is, I quit. I'm done. This is not what I signed up for. And you know I'm Baptist, so God doesn't speak audibly to me. But it was as if God was outside that second-story window yelling through the window, Great, Tim! That's great news. I'm so glad you finally have arrived at a place where I can do something in you. I'm glad you realize that preaching and ministry can't be done just because you have a gift for gab. Or just because you got an outgoing personality. Or just because you have a mind that sort of picks up on principles kind of quickly. That's not the kind of person I could use. I could use the broken. I can use the humbled. I can use the defeated. Because they are the one who lets me be God in them. Thank you for getting there, Tim. You see... The world speaks of the survival of the fittest, but it's God who gives His power to the faint of heart. It is God who provides His mighty resources to those who have no strength. It is God who perfects His strength in our weaknesses. It is God who uses the things, people like me who are not anything, to bring those who think they are something to not. I want you to consider with me for the remainder of our time this morning the three sources of strength, the three sources of Joshua's strength in a person that God can use. And if you came this morning on this Father's Day of 2021 thinking you were going to hear something extremely profound, what you are going to discover, the most profound things of the Scriptures are the simplest things. Um, Eddie Zosky was in the last service. I, actually, I could pick on, uh, on Danny Boitano. He's sitting in about the same place that Eddie Zosky was sitting in last service. All right? I'll use a baseball analogy. Those of you who may not know, uh, Danny Boitano made it to the big leagues. All right? As a pitcher. Uh, Hoover High Patriot. All right? In high school. And um, I think Danny will concur that what I'm about to say, I think he'll say, is accurate. If you were having problems on the mound, and since you were a pitcher, you probably never cared ever to be at bat. <laughs> but if your coach had a, a, a good hitter on the team who was struggling at the plate, or if he had an infielder who was struggling with his defensive skills, what a baseball coach will normally do with a pitcher or a fielder or a hitter who was struggling is he'll take them back and say, what we're going to go over today is the first 
things you learned about pitching, about hitting. About, we're going back to the basics. Because we try to get fancy. We try to improve upon the fundamental skills that are sound and solid in every great athlete. And when you get a skew, you must get back to the basics. And folks, the same thing is true in the Christian life. There are no shortcuts. There's nothing you can add to the basics that will make you a better believer than the presence of God in you, and He functions well under the basics. So what kind of person can God can use? Joshua illustrates that. Number one, Joshua was a person who talked with God. That's where it starts. Joshua is a person who converses with God. And please understand this. Joshua listened more than he talked. We have a tendency in our prayer time to talk a lot more than we listen if you go through the book of Joshua, I think you'll find about eight prayers. It's about all I could find, all right? About eight prayers. Two of them are blessings. They're about two sentences long, and the others are probably not more than a verse and a half. But you will find about three dozen times in the book of Joshua where God speaks to Joshua, and Joshua listens. Joshua was a person who talked with God. You see, Right out of the chute, Joshua chapter 1, God tells Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. So Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, Joshua, the servant of God. Moses was a servant. Joshua was a servant. But here's what's important, folks. It doesn't make a difference who the servant is except the servant. <laughs> That's the only time it means something. What's important is who's the master of the servant. See, all of us in this room, we're a servant to someone. You might say, oh, I'm the pilot of my own ship. No, you really aren't. The Scripture tells us, Jesus himself says, you will serve one of two masters. People, I, I don't mean to get offensive here. Sometimes when I talk like this, some folks get offended. I don't serve the devil. If you're not a servant to Jesus, then by default, that's who you serve. The, Jesus said it as simply as we possibly, that's the basics. In this world, you will serve one of two masters. You are either serving Jesus or you're either serving yourself, and by default, you are a child of the evil one. So who's the master? God encouraged Joshua in the same way that God encouraged Moses in the wilderness 80 years before out of a burning bush when God said to Moses, I will be with you. Wherever the sole of your foot will be placed, I will give you victory. And God says to you and us today, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always be with you. God promises His presence to us to fulfill His purpose by His power in us. Remember this, when you think about whose servant you are. If you are a child of God, God says this to you and me, greater is He that is in you than the one who is the master of this world. We don't have to be afraid of Satan, even though he roams around like a roaring lion, acting like he can devour you. Guess what? He only roars like that because he's terrified. He's not roaring because he thinks he wins. He roars because he's scared to death. That same principle is true, and I don't really have the time to elaborate on it today. I hope to get there next week. But what you have to understand is while the children of Israel were roaming around in the wilderness, scared to have entered the promised land 40 years before, those people in the promised land were terrified of the God of the children of Israel who were afraid to come into the land. And they told them that 40 years later. We were scared 40 years ago when you guys were here. What took you so long coming back? Well, Satan is terrified of Christ being functional in your life and in my life. We've just got to turn Jesus loose in us. Number two. Number one, Joshua was a person who talked with God. Number two. 
Joshua was a person who read God's Word. It's one of the instructions that come from God. Verse 8, always remember what is written in the book of the teachings. Study it day and night. Be sure to obey everything that is written in it. If you do this, you will be wise and successful in everything. Do you realize this is the Old Testament version of what Paul wrote in the New Testament? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, starts out the same way. Joshua 1, 8, study it day and night. 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, but one who can take the truth of God's Word and rightly apply it to their own life. How do I take a story out of the book of Joshua, read it, and how do I make sense of that in the way in which I live my life today? God says, study it. And I'll help you make sense of it. But you got to study it. It's not a casual reading. It's not just looking at the pictures. It's actually studying it. And it says, how often? Day and night. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the one who was the prince of preachers, the pastor of the the, the big metropolitan tabernacle Baptist church in England, uh, at a time nearly 200 years ago, He had 10,000 worshipers every Sunday morning, and people want to talk about megachurches today. And that was in England, folks. It sits 80% empty today. But in those days, the Prince of Preachers declared the Word of God to the congregants who came. And out of his sermons, he wrote a book called Morning and Evening. And it was a devotional book that derived its title from this passage right here. Study the Word, morning and evening. Let it be the bookends of your day. It was so interesting. Uh, Barna, who's a a Christian research analyst, uh, just recently produced an article that said, it's difficult for Christians to read the Bible 60 minutes a week. You break that down in seven days, how many minutes is that a day? That's less than 10 minutes in a day. And yet the admonition to Joshua is, study it day and night. Read your Bible. This is not a request. This is not a suggestion by God. God's not saying, hey, I've got a good idea. This is a directive. This is a specific command. And what you and I have to understand as the children of God is that when God gives commands, they're not for the purpose of being punitive. This is not like a dictator giving a command because he wants to control your every move simply for your pain and his blessing. No. God says, if you do this, I'm going to bless you. This is not punitive. This is productive. If we spend time on God's Word, there'll be less pain and problems in our life. Sam Storms wrote a book on the the book of Colossians, a commentary, and he describes what it looks like for the Word of Christ to dwell in us, as the New Testament says, richly. He talks about the Scriptures as calling out to us. And this is how he, he expresses it. He said, the Scriptures say, don't just read me, feast on me. Meditate, ruminate, saturate your spirit. Let my words wash over your soul like the refreshing waters, refreshing waters of a cool mountain stream. Hear them again, and then again, and then again, and maybe they permanently embedded into my brain, shaping how I think, and shaping the decisions that I make, and the way in which I live, and the way in which I relate to those around me. Don't be satisfied with a surface scan. Dig deeply, explore me, word upon word, line upon line, truth upon truth. Remember, Joshua is now in the position of Moses. All those 613 laws that were given to Moses, Joshua is now the one in charge of knowing them and taking care of disputes and arguments. He has to know them backwards and forwards and sideways. And just because you and I don't have people coming to us every day arguing about what happens if you eat a goat on Sunday doesn't mean that we shouldn't be reading the Bible either. Notice the promise he's given. If you do this morning and evening, you'll be wise and successful in everything. All if you read the Bible and follow its precepts. You see, guys, we, we maybe don't talk about this enough. This This is God's holy book. This is sacred. This is valuable. It's invaluable. 
This is God's express will to you. This doesn't contain God's Word. That's the excuse some folks use so that if they come across a part that they don't like, they can say, well, that's not what God said. No, God is consistent. And this is His book. We say we believe it. But do we really know what's in it? Do we know what's in this book about life and living? Do, do we know what this book has to say about how we should treat each other? How husbands and wives should treat each other? How parents and children should relate to each other? Do we know what it says about how living in a community and in a church fellowship, we should, we should express ourselves to each other? Do, do we know what this book says about work? Don't get me started on a tangent about unemployment when you could have a job. Do we know what this book says about generosity? Do we know what this book says about sex? Yeah, it talks about it. First thing it says is it's good. God created it. He said it's very good. But you got to read the book to know what makes it very good. In case you haven't read that far, it's called marriage. Anything outside of that is sin. Do you know that the book says that? Do you know what it says about dying? It says you will, in case you didn't know that part. Every one of us will. Do you know what it says about happens when you die? Have you taken the time to, since you know you're going to keep that appointment someday, do you know what it says? Do you know it says that when I walk through that valley of the shadow, I don't have to be what? Afraid. Why? Because he, the one who is my shepherd, is with me. And do you know what happens when you finish walking through the valley? Your transition from here to there. Do you, do you know what there is like? Do you even know what the Bible says about that? I, I, I have heard from people some of the screwiest things about what heaven will be like. And quite frankly, folks, I can't ultimately answer that question to anybody's satisfaction. Because God only gives us little glimpses, and most of those are somewhat symbolic. But do you know what he does say? He says it's beyond your wildest imagination. And I don't know about you, but I got a wild and crazy imagination. And it will be better than that. But do we know these things so that when these things occur in our life, we're ready for it? I mean, I mean, let me back up. Let me talk about sex for just a moment. Some of you are saying, where's the high school kids? Well, there's a few of them in here. Okay. Do you know what it says before you find yourself in a situation that you might want to engage in it before marriage? Do you know? Do you understand why God says those things? It's not punitive. It's productive. It's productive for us emotionally and mentally, physically, as well as spiritually. But if we, don't, if we don't know what God's Word says, then you know what? If I can cheat my neighbor in a business deal, I will. If it puts another 50 bucks in my pocket, sure, that's it. it's good for me. And man, it's got to be good for the church. I'll give another five bucks. Must be okay. No. Oh. But there's more. You see, what good is it just to read the Bible? We must trust it enough to obey it. And that's what leads us to the third strength of Joshua's life that made him a man that God can choose to use. Joshua was a man who obeyed the Word of God. Trust and obey, both parts. There's no other way. A couple of examples out of Joshua's life. In chapter 3, they're going to cross the Jordan River finally. God tells Joshua to wait three days. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> wait three days, kind of like the resurrection. All right. And then God tells Joshua to take the Ark of the Covenant. I like the way one author describes the Ark of the Covenant. He calls it the God box. The Ark of the Covenant, don't have time to go into that, but it contains some things out of Israel's past, all right, that was a reminder to them of God's faithfulness to them, of doing the miraculous in their lives to keep His Word to them. That, that Ark of the Covenant was always to be at the center of the people, and it was to lead the way. 
And on this particular occasion, God told Joshua to get four people, carry the God box out into the middle of the river. They were going to get their feet wet. They weren't going to start out on dry ground. This was a step of faith. Oh, by the way, do you want to know who I think the God box is now? See, the Ark of the Covenant was that which represented God's presence in the midst of the people. It's where His Shekinah glory came down and sat. Do you know where the Spirit of God comes to live now? In each one of us as His children. We are now His God box in this world. Are we leading people in the right direction? So they took the Ark of the Covenant out into the middle of the river, and the river dried up, and the people walked on dry ground. He tells them to do something, they do it, and it works. Imagine that. God even told them to get 12 people, one from each tribe, grab a rock from the middle of the bed of the river so they could make a remembrance, an altar on the other side so that people could come by that altar and not forget. It's why we do communion, so we don't forget what Christ has done for us. Remember the one who is faithful. Another example, what about Jericho? God tells them, don't attack Jericho, that big fit city. Don't take an army against them. Just start a parade. Everybody loves a parade, right? Once a day, walk around the walls, and on the last day, walk around it seven times, and then do what? Fire your weapons. Do what? Shout. Shout a praise to God. And what will happen? The walls will come tumbling down. And guess what? They did, and they won. God tells them to attack Gilgal after walking all night, no rest. And instead of resting, Joshua does what God tells him. They attack. And how do they win? <laughs> God didn't tell Joshua in advance. But they win because God sent a huge hailstorm from the sky. And, it makes, and then he makes the sun and the moon stand still a little longer. And it gives the children of Israel a chance to see their enemy longer, to defeat them, and probably kept them awake after traveling all night. You see, God never gave Joshua explanations as to how he might accomplish things. And God doesn't often give you and I explanations. He gives us promises. Because the children of God are to live on promises, not on explanations. When we trust God's promises and step out by faith, we can be sure that the Lord will give us the direction we need exactly at the moment that we need it. Joshua was told to, to do, and he did what he was told. Joshua understood the benefit of obedience. And do you know what the benefit of obedience is? I read it to you. Blessings. Do you like that word? Do you like the word blessings? Do you like it when somebody blesses your life? Usually it means they gave us a nice gift. They blessed us with a favor. The word blessings, it's a lot better than cursings, isn't it? Somebody cusses you out, that's not very favorable. Somebody blesses you, that's a good thing. You see, in order for us to live like that, this requires a long-term perspective rather than short-sighted emotions. It's why we must know the Word of God. We, to obey it, we've got to know it, and when we do that, we're blessed. Just give you a few references. Deuteronomy eleven twenty-seven. You will be blessed if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I've given you today. Jesus himself in Luke chapter eleven, verse twenty-eight. But even more blessed. I like that even better. More blessed. Blessing's good. More blessed is better. All who hear the word of God and put it into practice. And then the psalmist David in Psalm 119 says, You have charged us, O Lord, to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your principles. Then I will not be disgraced when I compare my life with your commands. When I learn your righteous ways, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your principles. Please don't give up on me, God. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word and following its directions. I have tried my best to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I, I, David said, have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your principles. You see, we got to do what's in it. And to know what to do, we got to read it. There was a traveler preparing for a long trip, and a friend asked him, if he was all packed up. 
Yep, the guy said, just about. Got my guidebook, my lamp, my mirror, my microscope, a volume of fine poetry. I've got a package of some old letters. I've got a songbook, a sword, a hammer, and another set of books. The friend said, man, you can't put all that in one suitcase. He said, sure I can. This doesn't take much room. And it doesn't. And we need to let it fill our hearts. So here's how I want to close today. We've talked about talking with God. We've talked about being in His Word. And then we've talked about once we know His Word, applying it to our lives as reflected in the character of obedience. So here's the question I want to close with. This is just between you and God. What is the most significant area of your life at this moment where you are not walking in obedience to the Lord? Because that's where God would like to start. If you're here and you're not a believer yet, you've never invited Christ to come live in you. Just because you're born in America doesn't make you a Christian. It's a choice that you and I must make. God has chosen to love us by the death of His Son on the cross and the risen life of Christ from a grave. He has provided for us redemption and salvation. It's very simple. It's not complicated. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to do any Hail Marys. You don't have to do any penance. You don't have to give any offerings. You just have to do as the thief on a cross did. Jesus, you don't deserve to be here. You are who you said you are. I deserve what I'm getting. Lord Jesus, would you remember me? Jesus himself said you must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And that's where it starts. But for the vast majority of us, we've already made that step. And so the next question is, what is an area of stubbornness on your part where you haven't yet wanted to give God permission by your obedience of submission to that area of your life? I have no idea what it might be. But our life is kind of like an onion. It's peeled in layers. Christ wants to take us deeper and deeper into who He is in our life. And where does He have you at this exact moment? Why don't you say, okay, Lord, I'm discouraged, I'm too weak, and I'm terrified to make this step. And God will say to you, finally, you're the man or woman I could use. You'll be my next Joshua in the next set of circumstances of your life. Just trust me. I'll do it if you let me. And once again, a perfect song for where we're going to be in today's, uh, today's message. I invite you to turn to Joshua chapter 2 and 3. We'll be reading from there in just a few moments. Um, Joshua's in the Old Testament. It is the sixth book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. All right, so we'll be in chapters 2 and 3 in a moment. Uh, I'm kind of excited about getting going. This is a wrap-up sermon today for a short series that we started at the beginning of the month. Uh, and I'll tell you now, um, I'm not going to finish. <laughs> so maybe sometime later in the summer we'll get back to one or two more sermons and we'll wrap this one up. Starting next week, there's going to be a, we have a couple of short sermon series that are going to be uh, led by Andrew and Pastor Mark as well. And so we'll be excited to hear them for the next few weeks, and uh, I'll be filling in somewhere in the middle of that, and maybe I'll do another wrap-up on this. But uh, I love the book of Joshua. And then I'm so excited to tell you that for uh, once we kick off back to school, uh, the three of us are doing something that none of us have ever done before, and uh, uncharted territories. We are working on a sermon series together. And so it'll be the same series and different ones of us preaching different parts of that series. And so we're pretty excited about that. And uh, I will tell you this, I make it a lot harder work on them when they have to put up with me preparing sermons, all right? Uh, but anyway, it's been great fun as we're still in our planning stages, and we look forward to doing that. Um, as you know, this is a series that uh, we launched at the beginning of the month because we sit in a particular particularly unique time in history. We're at the tail end of a pandemic, and that hasn't happened since my parents' generation. 
So it's been a long time since as a country or as a world, we've been at this kind of unique moment in history. And this gives us a chance to look back over this year of challenge and difficulty and trial. And as believers, what I'm asking us to do is let's be honest with ourselves in the presence of God and let's evaluate how did our faith do during these last 15, 16 months. And this is personal inventory only. You're not to evaluate me. I'm not to evaluate you. Especially spouses are not to evaluate each other. This is personal reflection. And as you're going through this personal reflection and you're asking yourself these seven soul-searching, life-shaping questions, don't answer them for anybody else and beware of self-justification. Don't make yourself look better in your own eyes than what we really are. This is a learning process. We're calling this Riverbank Reflections. And the best place for us to do this is at the River of Jordan. It's a, it's, it's a place of choice. You see, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, which was slavery to them. We just sung about that, the Red Sea experience, all right? Uh, And that is a picture for us in the New Testament times, in the 21st century times, as being enslaved in sin. We're, we're, We're trapped in Egypt, and God sets us free by the deliverance of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Red Sea is a picture of that baptism into this new life in Christ. And then coming to the River Jordan is entering into the fullness of all that God has for us experiencing promised land living, the abundant life that Jesus talked about, peace, joy, victory daily in our lives. Not a life without conflict. There's plenty of conflict in Canaan land, but a life that takes every step in confidence and faith in God, even when the life looks impossible. And that's the abundant life God is talking about. And so as we look at this historical event, we're also garnering from it application to our own daily life today. And so the the riverbanks of the Jordan River, the children of Israel came there. They were about ready to enter into the good of it. They looked at the fortified cities, the large armies, the giant, the giants that roamed the land, and they said, no, no, no. We're going to be intimidated by the circumstances rather than trusting in the promise of God. And they turned around and went back the way they came. And for 40 years, they wandered in a wilderness, eating the same meal, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner called manna. Occasionally a quail buffet was provided for them. But overall, it was a monotonous, miserable experience. And now they're back. It's the next generation. And they're at the same banks of the same river, and they have a chance to reflect back on the past and a poor decision that was made the previous time and decide if this time is going to be different. Riverbank Reflections are designed for us to think about the past with the intent of moving on into the future. And so as you and I sit in this unique moment in history and we look back, it's designed not to discourage us and defeat us, but it's designed to push us into the next step of our spiritual growth, wherever it is that we are today. We are not too young in Christ. We are not too old in Christ to advance across the River Jordan into all the goodness that God has promised to us. So let me just highlight those seven questions without much commentary today and then jump right into our passage. Number one, did the cultures, and and this has been in written form, it's been sent out in emails, I've said it every week, Uh, if you don't write fast enough, you're here for the first time today, call the office, we'll send it to you, all right? Here are the seven questions. Did the culture shape my faith or did my faith shape my response to the culture? Question number two, did my faith in and dependence on Jesus grow? Is it stronger now than it was at the beginning of 2020, or has this this year weakened my faith? Number three, did I enjoy and experience greater faith, or was I frustrated and manipulated by more fear? Number four, did I find myself frustrated by trying to fit my faith into the circumstances, or did I rest in my faith through the circumstances? Number five, did I investigate the Scripture more and less, more or less than I investigated news networks and Facebook? Six, has corporate worship, gathering with the faith family, become more a matter of convenience than conscience, comfort than commitment, self-centeredness rather than Christ-focused? Number seven, am I better prepared today for the what-ifs that will come in the future than I have been in the past? And remember a few things to kind of process all this through is it's not sin to use human means to help solve our problems. Wearing masks, staying socially distanced, taking a vaccine, none of those, all right, are, are sinful. 
But what is a sin is to trust those things more than we trust in God. To think that human ways are better than the ways of God or to leave God completely out of the problem-solving process is a serious mistake, and it's choosing independence from God, and that most definitely is a sin. Let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you are familiar with an Impala? I'm not talking about an, an Impala. Not the Chevy, the African version, all right? The, that that four-legged, fleet-footed critter, all right? An African Impala can jump to a height of over 10 feet and cover a distance greater than 30 feet. These magnificent creatures can be kept inside an enclosure in any zoo in the world with only a three-foot wall. Weird, isn't it? But here's why. The animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will land. Faith is the ability to trust when you and I cannot see, and with faith we are freed from the flimsy enclosures of life that fear entraps us in. Isn't it sad to be an Impala? You're able, but you're not willing. I wonder how many times that describes us as Christians. Have you ever been disappointed with your Christian life? Most of us at some time or another in the past, and maybe even possibly right now, have been or are. Oh, folks, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we're out and out sinners. Along with those who are fully immersed in the world's playground, because as believers, we have claimed the name of Jesus Christ in genuine faith, and we are members of His family. But when you hear me or other pastors or teachers talk about a life, a Christian life of perennial victory, when we quote scriptures like we are more than conquerors, when we share sermons about the reality that our life is hid with Christ in God, and we talk about unbroken and joyous communion with Christ, would you or most believers that you know be able to give a clear, affirmative response? I dare say, throughout my Christian life, more would recognize the sad part of that question than the positive side of that question. And yet, the study of the Scriptures, Old and New Testament is that the standard for the life of a believer in Jesus Christ should be a life of victory, not defeat. It should be a life of joy, not sorrow. It's not that we'll never experience a defeat, and it's not that we will never experience moments of sorrow, but what ought to be the dominant characteristics in our life as well-founded, deeply rooted faith believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, Watchman Nee. I'm often sharing authors with you that most of you have never heard about. How many of you have ever heard of Watchman Nee? Yeah, five of you. All right. Um, the reason you probably hadn't heard of him is he's dead, okay? But his writing is still very, very good. It's still very much alive. He wrote a book years ago, decades ago, called The Normal Christian Life. And Watchman Nee addresses this very subject. You see, we often look at a Christian who is living on the victory side of faith, and we think, wow, that is exceptional. And yet, Watchman Nee says, the Bible tells us, that's normal. So those of us who have a tendency to live more on the other side of things, we're the abnormal. The victorious side is the normal. Let me see if I can illustrate with just a few scriptures. And there are many more I could turn to, but let me give you some, and I, I'm going to quote these pretty quickly today. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be to God who always, how often? Always causes us to triumph. And he's not talking about riding a motorcycle. Obviously, none of you know that there was a motorcycle called a triumph. Okay, moving right along. Now, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the Savior of His knowledge by us in every place. Paul again writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4 and 5, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? He that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you invited him into your life? Then guess what? The writer of the Bible says, 
We are overcomers in this world. Romans 5.17, Paul again writes, They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one who? Jesus Christ. Romans 8.37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4, the biggest screw up in the Bible. He talks about living a victorious life, overcoming his mess ups. He writes this Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. His divine power has given us everything. What's left out? Nothing, because he's given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by our evil desires. Two more, Romans 6.14, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under law. We are the recipients of grace, 2 Corinthians 12.9. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power, it is made perfect. Where? In our weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Guys, that's the norm, not the exception. And the children of Israel have a chance at the riverbank this time to look back at the past, to look back at history, and to recognize, whoa, we were living an abnormal life last time we were here. This time, let's follow in normality the leadership of God in our life. Let's jump in. I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to read two entire chapters out of the Bible. Okay? So just follow along with me. I'll probably pause once or twice or five or six times. And, uh, and then after we've done that, I hope to very quickly kind of pull it all together with some wrap-up conclusion and application for our life. But let's just jump in, because uh, the reason I'm doing this is I, I, I have no idea how many of you really know the background of the story. And so it's important for us to, to, to read this. So jump in, chapter 2. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Now, Joshua, remember, was one of 12 spies 40 years before who was sent in to check out the land the first time they were there, when they turned away out of fear rather than proceeded on in faith. Joshua learned something. Twelve's too many. <laughs> Let's just send two. Okay? Let's just send two. So he sends two, and he says, go look over the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute. Wow. Your pastor sends two of his deacons to a new town, and he tells them, go check out the house of prostitution. <laughs> Doesn't make the best sense, but that's okay. I don't know about you, but that would have required faith on my part to have gone to her place because I would have been very fearful of that. So they went, and they entered her house named Rahab, and they stayed there. Wow. And by the way, some of you know the end of the story to Rahab. She ends up becoming a wonderful woman of faith, uh, but she never, she never outlived the stigma of being a prostitute. Every time she's mentioned, even later in the New Testament, they clarify who it is. Rahab the prostitute. But her life changed. Her character became something far, far more. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. I find this fascinating. The enemy, the enemy was on guard for the children of God. And it causes me to wonder, is God's church on guard against the enemy called the world? The world's on guard against us. Are we available to what God wants to tell us is coming. So the teen of Jericho sent out his message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them and said, Yes, the men came to me, but I do not know where they are. Oh, I do not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. And let me pause right here. She lied. Okay. And the, the, the intent of today's message is not to discuss, is it ever appropriate to lie? Maybe I'll do that one somewhere down the road, all right? But I'll just openly acknowledge she was a bit untruthful here, okay? But let's not get bogged down in that. Verse 6, but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stacks of flax that she had laid on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. 
Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in the country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. How long ago had that happened? Forty years ago. The people living in the land of Canaan are terrified of the God of the children of Israel for 40 years. While the children of Israel were roaming around in the wilderness, terrified of the people living in the land of promise, the people living in the land of promise were terrified of the God of the children of Israel. What a wasted 40 years. We have heard how he dried up the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og and the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed when we heard of it. When we heard of it, 40 years ago, our hearts sank and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. What a confession from a multi-theistic hooker. This is a whoop. I shouldn't have said hooker, should I? Kids are in a room. Here's a woman whose culture was to believe in any and every God there was out there. And she identifies right here the one God, the God of Israel, and she's going to put her faith in Him. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so your pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves for how long? Three days until they return and then go on your way. And the men said to her, this oath you made to us will be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window. A red rope. Hang it in your window when we come to take over the city of Jericho. You who live in this house where the scarlet red cord is, your lives will be saved. This is a picture of the scarlet thread of redemption that starts in the book of Genesis and takes us all the way through the book of Revelation. It starts when God has to destroy a couple of animals to provide clothing to cover the nakedness, the human nakedness. Now it becomes sinful in the lives of Adam and Eve. We find it again Again, with Abraham and Isaac on the mountaintop, when God provides a substitutionary sacrifice, the thread of redemption, we find it in their recent history, 40 years before, when the children of Israel needed to escape Egyptian bondage, and God said before the 10th plague, hey, you guys, make the sacrifice and take the blood of the sacrifice and put it on the doorpost before you go to bed that night. That way, when the death angel comes, it will not take any life inside your home, the scarlet thread of redemption that ends when Jesus Christ shed His precious blood for you and me as a forgiveness of all of our sin, past, present, and future, so that we could enter in to the good of the promise that He has made for us, not just heaven when we die, but His his presence in us in the here and now from now until then. That is the hope that he has for all of us. Scarlet thread of redemption. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Could this be this scarlet rope in the window? The world took that and perverted it and now they put red lights in the inappropriate districts and communities. Hmm. The evil one always wants to pervert that which is good. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on your own head. He will not be, we will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath and made a, and that we made you swear. Again, she replied, let it be as you say. So she went with them as they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And if you want to know how the story ends, go to chapter 6, verse 17, when this sermon is over. When they left, they went to the hills and stayed three days until the pursuers had searched along the road. And then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given us the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. These two spies not only had good eyes, but they also had great faith. Chapter 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord 
will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant, cross over to the head of the people. So they took it up, and they went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel, so they may know I am with you like I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan, go and stand in the river. And Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the word of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. He will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and the Parasites. Oh, I added that last one. I'm sorry. <laughs> See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth and go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, the water flowing downstream will be cut off, and it will stand up in a feat. That would be quite a feat, wouldn't it? I'm just throwing them right over your heads today, aren't I? Feet, feet, okay. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap and a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation completed the crossing on dry ground. Let me now back up and just hit some highlights out of those two chapters. First off, I want you to notice that after the spies came back, they're told to wait three days before they go in. I mean, they've waited 40 years. What's three more days? But there's, there's two good reasons for the delay. The first good reason for the delay was there was a soul that needed to be saved. We often look at the God of the Old Testament. People say he was such an angry God in the Old Testament. No, he's not. He's a God always filled with grace, Old Testament, New Testament. He, he chose to wipe out the Hittites, Hivites, all, all those Ike people, all right, because they didn't have a heart that wanted anything to do with God. They wanted their own gods. They wanted, but if there was any of them that wanted to come over and believe in the God of Israel, God would go to great lengths to save them. Look what he did for Rahab. This was not the mayor of, of Jericho. This was not the general of the army. This was a prostitute who for 40 years had had a heart hungry to know the God of Israel. And so Joshua did what Jesus did. Jesus, when he had his 12 disciples, sent them out two by two. For what purpose? To share the grace of God and bring men and women to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And Joshua under the influence of God, sends two spies. For what purpose? So that one person could experience the grace of God and find forgiveness and salvation for her life. That's worth a delay, huh? Sometimes you and I wonder, how come God doesn't come quickly now in the world that we live in? The reason it doesn't come, folks, is because His grace is still at work. There's still a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, who God knows with his foreknowledge, they want to experience and receive and accept the grace of God in their life. And God will delay until his grace reaches every person that wants it. Rahab's that picture of that for us. Because of her faith and the shelter she gave to God's people in her home, she became one who shared in the blessings of the land of Canaan. She became a part of the ancestry of Jesus Christ himself. This woman's faith produced works and delivered blessings. In case you didn't know it, she's one of only two women who's mentioned in the heroes of the Hall of Fame of Faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and not Esther, not Ruth, not Deborah, Rahab the prostitute, listed in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And her name is also listed another time. It is listed in the lineage of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. She was part of the ancestry of the human birth of Jesus Christ. Talk about transformation. God's grace does. So not only was there a soul that needed to be saved, but the second reason for this short delay before they entered in was a sanctification needed to be completed. 
Let me share three quick directives that the children of Israel followed that you and I must also follow today if we're going to enter into the next phase of abundant life with Christ, victorious living, the normal Christian life. Number one, in verse 3, chapter 3, Joshua tells the people, set your eyes on the ark. This is very similar to something that Moses said to the children of Israel in the wilderness when there had been a lot of death going on. Folks were dying all over the place, and God told Moses, get a staff, put a bronze serpent on it, hold it up in the middle of the camp, and tell the people all around here, look and live. By the way, what's the symbol of the medical profession? Where'd that come from? Numbers chapter 21, verse 8, look and live. And that is exactly what Joshua was telling the people of Israel here. Look, watch the ark. It is the, it's, the, it's the visible expression of God's presence in our midst. You keep your eyes on His presence and you follow it. Let me ask you this question. Where's the face, first place you look when a decision needs to be made? Where's the first place you look when you encounter a crisis? Where's the first place you turn when you become the recipient of some grand blessing in your life? Do you pat yourself on the back and say, I deserved it? Do you look around at a crisis and try to figure out, how can I outfox it? When a decision has to be made, do you turn to God as a last resort? Self-circumstance or God, where's your first look? Are you investigating risk factors to make a decision, or are you investigating faith factors to make a decision? The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. Look and follow. The second instruction was not only set your eyes on the presence of God, but number two, sanctify your life. In other words, get things square in your life. This is a moment of reflection on the riverbank before you're about ready to make a big decision. Don't make this an emotional decision. Make this a faith decision. Think, pray, contemplate about your own life. Sanctify yourselves. What will happen tomorrow if I do? The Lord will do wonders among you. You are going places you've never been before, God says. And God is about to do something you've not seen Him do before. He's about to move in a wonderful, powerful way in your life, in your presence, in your midst, in your circumstances. That which has been unknown and unseen is about to be known and seen by you. But we are to prepare ourselves for that. Will we do the preparations that God requires? You see, without the preparations, the wonders will be missed. You're saying, Tim, what kind of preparations do I need to make? Let me make three suggestions. Number one, moments like this are times to change some unhealthy habits. And some of you are thinking about, well, (laughs) what are you talking about, drug use and alcoholism? It could be. How about wasting too much time on a hobby that has nothing to do with a relationship with God and prevents you from having time to develop your relationship with God? Don't miss it. Guys, I got, you guys know I got hobbies. I did one of them for the first time in six months this last week. I went golfing. Oh, you should have seen me. Create good humor. I tell you what, though, I got more money out of every stroke. I got a better deal than everybody else I played with. I got more strokes in for the money I paid. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we can't have hobbies. But what are some habits that we have that aren't healthy for us, that don't promote a healthy walk with Christ and create more fear than developing faith? Uh, This is also a time to confess some unholy decisions. Though we have found forgiveness of God for our sin, there are still some poor choices we made that led to some horrible things in our life that we have not let go of. And we need to bring those unhealthy decisions and finally just lay them and say, God, I know you've forgiven me, but I haven't forgiven myself. Let's deal with these unholy decisions that I made. And it is also time then to choose an undeniable direction. Look at the presence of God in your life and follow it no matter where it leads you. You see, the people of Israel are looking at the land that God had promised them. They're standing on the banks of the Jordan where these people had been 40 years before. And at this moment, they are seeing the end of 40 years of walking in a circle and going nowhere. 
they're beginning to see the end of striving without ever arriving. They are at the end of walking strictly by sight. They're about to step by faith. They're at the end of independent living. They're at the end of being constantly reminded of previous failures. They're at the end of fear and disappointment. They're at the end of self-centered existence. And the key preparation for moments like this is always the condition of our relationship with God. Oswald Chambers said, Consecration means the continual separating of myself to one particular thing. Do you have that kind of priority in your relationship with Jesus Christ? One continual thing. And you continue to sanctify. You continue to consecrate. It's not once and done with consecration. It's every next step. Then we will see God do great things among us. So, Set your eyes on the ark, which represents the presence of God, to sanctify your life, separating yourselves from those things which may be displeasing or destructive to our relationship with God. And last of all, step into the water. Trust and obey. You see, God is going to do some great things among you, but you've got to step into the water. God parted the water before their very eyes and allowed them to cross the Jordan River. But the folks, the people there had a responsibility. They had to set themselves apart in body and spirit. They had to completely set themselves apart from the fear of the unknown and what might happen to us if we go this direction. They had to consecrate themselves totally to God. And that's what faith is, trusting God in body and spirit. And God said, I'll do wonders among you. Imagine the drama of that moment when those priests approached the Jordan River. What would have... What would it have been like if nothing had happened? Have we been hearing God right? Or, or, or is this just wishful thinking? The river at this particular moment that we read to, it's a mile wide. It's at flood stage. The muddy waters are running rapidly towards the Dead Seas. The priest carrying the ark step into the river is ordered. And, and the initial step, there's no apparent change. Can you imagine the first two in the water? Nothing happens. <laughs> and they got to take four or five more steps before the next two guys behind them get their feet in the water. It is not until all of them have their feet in the water that all of a sudden, the Scripture tells us, the water began to stack up on top of itself. And the priests had to stand their ground as approximately 3 million people crossed over on dry ground. Do you want to be an example of Christ-likeness, of faithfulness? These priests were the first to enter the danger zone, and they were the last ones to leave it. As they stand in the middle of a Jordan River, their faith is tested and exercised every moment they stand there. The waters are not flowing right now, but there is a wall of water just down the river bend. What if that wall of water turns loose? What if that invisible force that has it standing up goes away? Any of you ever fished at the bottom of Millerton Dam? in the San Joaquin River. It's a cool place to fish. One, it really is cooler there. The spray coming off the water, coming out of the dam. There are some very, very big fish in that. It's hard to get to that area. My dad used to love to get down there. We actually snuck in a few times. And, and, and it's, but I tell you what, if, if you grew up going to school hearing the story about the boy sticking his finger in the hole in the dike, I looked up at the size of that dam at Millicent Lake, and I looked at my dad one time, and I said, Oh, Dad, I don't think my finger's big enough. <laughs> if that dam broke, there would be no hope at all. And these folks, these priests, these folks, that, okay, you're the first ones in line of three million people. You hurry across, but you're at the midway point. You keep looking down there at that wall. What if it cuts loose? See, we think, oh, that's a piece of cake. Walk on dry ground. Yeah, but looming out there is a danger. Do we have enough faith to believe that the God who can hold up the water will hold up the water for us? We must persevere as we stand our ground. That's what Paul meant when he said, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've what? Kept the faith. It's what he means in Ephesians 6 when he says, therefore put on the full armor of God so when the evil comes, you can stand your ground. And after you've done everything, what should you do? Stand. Keep standing. The Amplified says it this way, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground on that day of danger and having done everything the crisis demands, stand firm in place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. There's a difference between this generation of Israelites and their forefathers when they stood in that same place 40 years before. Oh, all the enemies were still there. All the circumstances were still there. But this generation, the Scripture says, they had a different spirit. They were willing to risk it all in obedience to God. They were willing to approach fortified cities, to face giants, 
to step into the water and see God work on their behalf. They were willing to leave the familiarity of the past and go into the unknown of the future because that's where God was leading. Acts chapter 15 verse 26 describes Paul and Barnabas like this. These are men who have risked their lives for the name of Jesus Christ. What are you willing to risk to honor the name of Christ? Reputation? Finance? Personal safety or security? You see, the difference between the first generation Israelites coming out of Egypt and this generation is the risk factor. They had a risky faith. For some of us, perhaps all of us, it's a time for a transition. It's time for new opportunities, new doors, not without battles, not without conflict, but some incredible victories if we will just step out, watch God at work on our behalf. Hudson Taylor, the one who started China in Inland Mission, said, unless there's an element of risk in our exploits for God, there is no need for faith. Let me wrap this up. In Rum with the Horses, Author Eugene Peterson writes about a family of birds teaching their young to fly. Three young swallows were perched on a dead branch that stretched out over the lake. One adult swallow got alongside the chicks and started shoving them out towards the end of the branch, pushing, pushing, pushing. The one on the front end fell off, and somewhere between the branch and the water four feet below, the wings started working and the fledgling was off on its own. And then it was the second one, knocked off and off on its own. The third was not going to be bullied. At the last possible moment, his grip on the branch loosened just enough to be swung upside down and then tightened again, hanging upside down from a dead branch, bulldog tenacious. This parent was without sentiment. This father bird pecked at the desperately clinging talons until it was more painful for the chick to hang on than risk the insecurity of flying. The grip was released and the inexperienced wings began to pump and the mature swallow knew what the chick did not, that it would fly. God, your Father, knows what you may not know. And that is He can enable us to mount up with wings as eagles and fly when we step out and move out in faith. Birds have feet and can walk, and they have talons that can get grasp a branch securely. They can walk, they can cling, but flying is the characteristic action. Not until they fly are they living at their best gracefully and beautifully. Victory, folks. Victory is the natural climate that God's children are to live in. Not defeat, not wilderness, but promise. And we cling to the dead things of the past rather than rising with the newness of life that God brings to us. It's time to change. For some of you today, it'll be some unhealthy habits. It's time to confess. For some today, it'll be some unholy decisions. It's time to choose an undeniable direction. I will only go where God leads. We sang about it together. A few minutes ago, you unravel me, and I'm no longer a slave to fear. Why? I am a child of God. Are we living like His children? Oh, we can, and we should. So let's do it. Let's pray right now. If Rahab... If Rahab could pray and find the grace of God, so can you and me. Our Father, thank you for the history of this story. Father, thank you for its, its broader reflection of what the Christian life should be like today. Christian life is not absent of conflict, challenges, and difficulties. But, Father, the Christian life is one that has guaranteed victory. If we will set our eyes on Christ, if we will sanctify our life, and if we will step into the waters by faith, trust, and obey. God, you know, you know what's being said to you by each life that's here. There might be one or two who at this very moment are saying, Lord, I don't have all this figured out, but if a, 
if a hooker at Jericho could fight Jesus, then I want to fight you today too. The vast majority of us are going to deal, Father, with some unhealthy habits that are taking time and thought away from growing and nurturing our relationship with you. Others are going to deal with some things that are out of their past that they just haven't, they haven't forgiven themselves over. And God said, I forgave you a long time ago. Let's deal with it now once and for all. Father, I hope all of us choose to go in an undeniable direction that you lead us. Thank you, Lord, for hearing all of our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, go have a great week.